Well, good morning. I uh, want to welcome you to the uh, September 2nd uh, Financial Aid Advisory Committee meeting of the Coordinating Board. Uh, my name is Ed Caressley. I chair uh, this committee. Uh, this is my last meeting as chair, and uh, that will be one of the items uh, as we go through the day is, is uh, transferring chair and, um, and, and membership as we um, roll into uh, the next year, but this is the last committee meeting of uh, this year's advisory committee. I just want to uh, make some folks aware of some general guidelines uh, with this virtual meeting today. Uh, first of all, this meeting is being streamed uh, via YouTube. Um, just a reminder that if you're not speaking, if you can just uh, make sure that your mics are uh, unmute or are muted, and then when speaking, unmuted. Uh, that will just cut down on possible background noise. Um, we will be establishing a quorum uh, for this meeting through roll call. Uh, if there are any motions, uh, we will take a voice vote. If the results are unclear, uh, then we will uh, go to uh, a roll call vote. Ask that you just wait uh, for uh, an individual to finish uh, speaking before the next individual speak again, just to avoid um, some muddledness or, or unclarity of, of what uh, might be shared. Uh, we do have a raise hand feature uh, that can be used to, to help uh, the chair or others recognize you uh, so that you can share uh, any thoughts, uh, information that you have. Uh, handouts will not be uh, necessarily displayed, uh, but they are available on the agency's website and uh, uh, the link to that website and information uh, is provided on the screen here uh, and is available um, for you. Uh, we'll plan uh, to take a short break, maybe 10 minutes around 1030, uh, depending on kind of how the meeting is going. Um, and so that uh, a little bit of information to get our meeting started today. Uh, do need to begin uh, with establishing a quorum by taking a roll call. So uh, when I call your name, if you just acknowledge uh, your presence um, and we'll move on. So first of all, Denise Welch. Here. Robert Marino. Here. Deshay Reed. Here. Taryn Anderson. Here. Ben Bolin. Here. Victoria Chen. Here. Rachel Garrett. Here. Didi Gonzalez. Here. Heidi Granger. Here. Bridget Ingram. Here. Tam Gwynn. Here. Holly Nolan. Here. Uh, Shauna Norton. Here. Steven Peterson. Here. Thomas Ratcliffe. Kelly Steelman. Here. Joy Thomas. Arnold Here. Trejo. Here. Uh, Foreman Thompson. And Jace Kugia. Here. Uh, it looks like we do have a quorum, uh, and so uh, we can continue on uh, with the meeting. Uh, first item of business is approval of the minutes from our last meeting on June 3rd. Uh, these minutes were uh, distributed with the handouts. Um, just ask if there are any corrections or clarifications needed. If not, uh, then would just ask uh, or just uh, uh, state that these uh, minutes uh, are approved uh, as distributed um, from our last meeting. Item C is updates uh, from uh, past business of the advisory committee and uh, we'll turn things over to Deshay Reed. And good morning, everyone. So we did have some prior FAAC uh, business. Um, we had some FAAC rules that were proposed in a Texas registry 
on May 14th and they received no comments. They were approved by our board on July 22nd. Uh, the proposed rules do go into effect on September 10th. In addition to extending out the FAAC for another four year period, the rules implemented the recommendations of changing the start of the committee term member terms to the first meeting of the state fiscal year, which will begin September 1st. It also reduces the number of student representatives from two to one, adds representatives from the nonprofit sector with responsibility of advising students regarding financial aid. We also wanted to provide the recommended slate of nominations for our board approval that will happen in October. So I'll go through a list of the recommended FAC committee members. Jackie Adler, Executive Director of Financial Aid at Texas State Technical College. Cecilia Jones, Director of Financial Aid at Jarvis Tr Christian College. Millette Leif Green, Director of Financial Aid at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Sal Ramirez, College and Career Readiness Coordinator, El Paso ISD. Joseph Ruiz, Director of Financial Aid at Del Mar College. He's going to do the remaining of the uh, term for Joanna Boley, who's retired. Tevin Sides, Director of Financial Aid at Western Texas College. Gilbert Zavala, Vice President of Austin Chamber of Commerce. And Robert Moreno, President-elect for TASFA. So that is all the prior business information that we had. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, well then I guess we can move on to the next agenda item, Ed. Thank you, Deshay. Um, we have opportunity now to have a presentation uh, by uh, some colleagues uh, from uh, other parts of the country here. Uh, glad that they're able to join us virtually. Um, the presentation they're going to be providing is about hidden bias in professional judgment. Uh, our presenters are Daniel Barkowski, Barkowski, I apologize, um, Assistant uh, Vice President uh, for Financial Aid and Veteran Affairs at Valencia College in Florida, and uh, Michael Burchett, uh, the Director of Financial Aid at Bluegrass College in Kentucky. So uh, we'll just turn things over to them. Just want to confirm you can see the screen. Can, you, can everyone see the screen with the presentation? Yes. Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Barkowitz, and no problem, Ed. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not an easy name, so no worries at all. Uh, my name is Daniel Barkowitz, and I am with you today from Orlando, Florida. Um, beautiful uh, view of Walt Disney World, close to close to the house. I get the fireworks every evening from the home. So um, so I'm in Orlando. It's a pleasure to be with you and with my colleagues in Texas. Um, I would have preferred to travel to be with you, but you know it's great to be able to do this virtually. So. Um, and I want to thank Michael uh, Burchett, who's going to join us as well. Michael had a job change, uh, I think, since we last gave you that information. So, uh, Michael, good morning. Morning. Yeah, I'm at the University of Kentucky, uh, where I'm the director of, of counseling and outreach uh, for the financial aid office. Um, shall we get right into it, Daniel? You ready? I think Are, you should. Do some housekeeping. Absolutely. Um, so typically this this session is is uh, our presentation rather um, works really well when we're in person. Um, a lot of the energy kind of gets taken out um, over Zoom. Um, but I do want to say at any moment in time, Daniel can see comments. So if you've got something that you would like to say, typically if we were in person, it, we would just be conversing back and forth and it would be very easy. Um, obviously over Teams or Zoom types of, of platforms, that makes it a little more difficult. Um, but yeah, if you've got a comment at any point in time, feel free to put it in the chat and Daniel will stop us and we can we can talk about that then or we can talk about things at the end. But, but please feel free to interrupt at any point in time or give any opinion. Um, we, we welcome those things. Um, so this uh, the, the presentation here is just recognizing hidden bias and professional judgment. Um, you can go into the next slide, Daniel. Um, just a few things about what's not on the agenda. So please know that neither Daniel nor I are um, have any degrees in um, 
in in this type of thing. This is something that we do as practitioners of professional judgment in in financial aid. So um, this isn't going to go into any type of professional judgment regulations in financial aid. Typically, that's who we're, we we speak with. Um, but just know we're not going to cover any of those types of things um, in this presentation. Um, and what I was saying before, neither Daniel nor I have any degrees in psychiatry or any, or or, or um, anything like that. So we're not going to give you any expert psychological opinions. Um, that's not what we're here for. And anytime we talk about bias, um, sometimes it can make some folks uncomfortable. But also know that despite the fact that some of the topics we're going to cover can cause some discomfort, um, there is no partisan or political agenda with this presentation whatsoever. We're just here to, to talk about um, hidden bias and how it affects our profession. Um, what is on the agenda, um, very sincerely, is just an attempt to better understand how, keyword how we form decisions and opinions, um, which I think is kind of the start to understanding bias. Um, to be able to explore our own cap our own capacities for hidden biases and um, also just an attempt to be better practitioners of professional judgment and I also say in life itself because um, I think these things are, are they spread out even further than than our profession this is how we interact as people so it's very important and I'll just I'll just add to that yeah point. go ahead um, so I will say uh, this is kudos to Michael Michael was the one who introduced this topic to me in a session at a SASFA conference several years ago. Um, uh, Michael and I know each other through the, the regional association, and um, I had a chance to observe Michael's early presentation and just fell in love with what he sh was sharing, and, and really it, it was life-changing. Um, I don't often say that about presentations that I sit in in conferences. Probably you're like, you're like me. You can barely get through the hour and a half uh, that a session might be. Uh, but if you open yourself up to this, it, when he says in this that it's an attempt to be better practitioners of life, I, I wouldn't minimize that. Um, and it had an, a humongous impact on me, on my professional development, and really on my involvement in this in the world. So um, kudos to you, Michael, and thank you again for being willing to let me play with you in the sandbox and for doing this today. Thanks, Daniel. Um, some of the session essentials, which we alter a little bit because we're over Zoom, but the, the first thing that's really important is just introspection. And what we mean by that is just being able to examine or observe your own mental and emotional processes. Um, we also need honesty. And again, if this was in person, face to face, this would be even more important. But just as we seek to learn and talk about biases, um, the best thing there is for us to be honest with ourselves and with one another. And because of that, it leads to the next thing that we that is essential, which is just charity toward one another. Anytime you're in a situation where people are learning and they really want to engage, sometimes they can feel exposed about certain things or certain beliefs that they have. And so if anyone shares something, please know that we want the forum to be something where we are honest and charitable. So even if something doesn't come out the right way, just just the charity that we're trying to learn in the space um, about about these things. Um, also, just at least an openness and a willingness to consider the data that we present. Um, you know, sometimes people just immediately assume something's, you know, that can't be right or whatever, but just just at least be willing to, to consider that data and, and, and see how it applies to you. To you. Um, this will be minimized far more because of the platform, but um, conversation is welcome. Um, also, what is welcome is the next couple of things, which are examples or your stories. And I realize that, again, with this forum, it's a little more difficult, um, but we do welcome those things. Um. Great. So so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over from here and just say a word about this. So obviously, we, we're talking about hidden bias in professional judgment. So we really can't begin until we at least identify what we're talking about here in terms of professional judgment. And obviously, all of us are living in a space right now where there is so much of a request, I imagine you are, we're seeing it at my institution. Uh, the numbers of requests for professional judgment are staggering with the changes in the economy, uh, with what's gone on with the pandemic, with people being out of work. We're just seeing, we, we're seeing literally a doubling of the number of professional judgment requests that are coming in in comparison to what we had pre-pandemic. Um, and so, you know, there's just a couple of things that we wanna highlight um, as we talk about professional judgment and as we sort of frame this as a beginning piece. 
you know, this is not a dictionary definition. This is not a legislative definition. But but the idea here that we want to talk about is the idea that that as financial aid administrators, we have discretion to adjust the COA, to adjust the expected family contribution on a case-by-case basis. And with that discretion comes the risk of bias because we are individuals who review and make decisions on a case-by-case basis. And so one of the challenges that we want to make sure we talk about and address is that discretion. Um, and because we have you know wide latitude on these kinds of issues, not just COA, EFC, but also SAP and other types of eligibility appeals, it's important that we take a moment to think about what is the process behind our decision making? Um, how do we, you know, in a sense, try to ensure that we remove whatever biases we may have and take the case at face value? And so that's one of the pieces really that we hope you take away and begin to explore um, as we begin to turn to the actual topic at hand. So the first thing um, I would ask if we were all together is, is what your thoughts or what your definition is when you hear the word bias. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult to do over this this um, context. I'll go ahead and tell you what we tell people at the end. But what we're speaking about while we're here is uh, a definition that basically is prejudice in favor of or against a thing, person, group compared with another, and typically in a way that we would consider to be unfair. So when we're talking about bias, this is kind of the, the definition that, that we that we go forward with in this presentation. Um, in this next slide, I would also ask all of you um, to raise your hand if you think you're biased. And I think, uh, can you raise hands on Teams? I know you can on Zoom. I don't know. Yep. You can do it if you want. You don't have to. I'm not going to be mad. Um, but typically what I'll, t- <laughs> I'll tell you what we normally see is normally we see about half the room raise their hand and about half uh, uh, do not. And I tell the half that do not that, you know, they're wrong. <laughs> so anyway, um, we go with the assumption that that we all contain bias. Um, and I'm in this next slide. Okay. Can, yeah, I say, can I bring you back just one second, Michael? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the thing that really surprised me the first time that I saw this definition is the use of the word um, in favor of. Because I think we often think about bias as a prejudice against something, but I don't think we often recognize that we could be biased in favor of, and that has an equal, if not um, uh, you know, greater impact potentially than a bias against something. So I know we'll talk more about this as we go on, but I just want to highlight, you know, often I think we think of bias as as some, as a as a prejudice against. Um, and the other thing that I think is interesting is the word usually. Right. So it doesn't have to be unfair, um, but it's usually in a way to consider it to be unfair, which, again, opens up a really interesting thought in my mind around, you know, uh, biases where it isn't unfair, but you still could be biased and sort of, you know, examining that. And that, that might expand. It did expand my definition of what bias was. I don't know if anyone has any comments or if you want to add anything to that. But again, those two pieces stuck out to me. So oh, I think we went back instead of forward. I'm sorry, back to the... I think the, we went back instead of forward. Didn't yeah, I did. Let's see. Yep, here we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, so just to give you just a little bit of background on where the this presentation came from. So as an early administrator of financial aid, um, I was part of committees, which is which is typical, uh, reviewing different types of, of appeals that students may have, where we can exercise our professional judgment under statute. Um, and I over and over and over, as you would have discussions about the fate of a student, um, I would notice that people across the table who I respected as practitioners of financial aid and that I knew were good people, right? They were good moms and dads and they were good kids and they were good siblings. They were good people, but they would be coming to completely different decisions than the one that I had. And it would shock me over and over how people who interact on a daily basis could just look at a student's situation and see it from very different perspectives and just kind of dig in their heels about, you know, yes, the student should be approved. This is a rough situation. And someone else says, no, no, it shouldn't. Um, And so I already had that in my head. And then at a regional financial aid uh, panel on satisfactory academic progress, which isn't specifically professional judgment, but it is a, it's an appeal situation 
where obviously students try to re to regain their aid because of an extenuating circumstance, we started talking about um, a hypothetical situation with pregnancy. Um, and the room got really divided. It was a very, very large populated room in this session. And people were, you know, we had people on one side saying pregnancy is not an extenuating circumstance. You know what you're getting into. And then somebody else is like, who are you to say that? And, I, and it just got back and forth about whether or not pregnancy was an extenuating circumstance in um, a failed term academically. Um, and so I started to just kind of see some commonalities. And so um, I asked people to raise their hands, you know, in general, I was like, you know, raise your hand if you think it's an extenuating circumstance, you know, that pregnancy can be considered that way. And basically the majority of females raised their hands. And then I was like, you know, you tell me if you think it's not. And almost all males in a fraction of the women said, no, it's not an extenuating circumstance. So then I drilled down on the women who were in that category. And I said, of those of you who are raising your hand, how many of you have had children? And all the hands went down. And so in my head, I, I'm starting to formulate this presentation in my head, which is basically like, goodness gracious, you know, the Department of Education gives us this power, which we talked about before, this discretion. And here we all are making judgments based on our, basically our experience. Um, you know, you've got, again, the majority of males, it's not an issue. And then the majority of those uh, of females who had had children, it's not an issue. And everybody, it's, so it's just based on our experience, we formulated whether or not we believe that pregnancy is something. And so lots of times as we come to the table as practitioners of financial aid and we're trying to make decisions, we are bringing in this truckload of bias with us of just from experiences and how we've been raised, how we see the world, all these kinds of things. So I started thinking about Again, being around good people, good practitioners, but having such differing views. And I started looking up different types of bias and started studying on bias. And I came across this book, um, which is called Blind Spot. And what really caught me to purchase it and buy it was that spot in that black circle that says hidden biases of good people. And I'm like, that's exactly what's in my head right now. It's like, well, how can I be so angry about that other person who disagrees with me? But I know they're good people. What's happening? And so I bought this book and I read it. And what we're basically going to show you is these are people that study these things. And they basically have come up with this, I don't know, let's just call it, you know, a narrative on these types of things about how we formulate and, 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 and make decisions and how our judgments aren't as accurate as we might think they are. Um, so, Daniel, if you want to advance the slide there. Um, so what they basically talk about are several different things, but one of the categories of things they talk about are called mind bugs. And this is just a name that the authors give to these different types of phenomena. And so there's several different types. There's some that address visual mind bugs and how we think we see things accurately and how sometimes we are, are, are mistaken. Um, mind bugs that have to do with our memory. There are mind bugs that deal with availability and anchoring and also social mind bugs. And so we're going to kind of walk you through these different mind bugs in these next slides. And I believe, Daniel, you take over from here, right? I do, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to look at this image. I'm about to put up an image on the screen. And all of you should be able to give me a response. So if you look at where the, um, where the hand raise function is, I'm going to give you either two options, either a like or a heart. Um, and so let's look, and I, I'd love to see everyone give a vote. So here is the picture. Um, so if you agree that the two tabletops that I'm showing you are exactly the same size and shape, please give me a thumbs up. So thumbs up, they're the exact same size and shape. If you think they are different in size and shape, give me the heart sign. So again, looking at these together, are they exactly the same size and shape or are they different in size and shape? So I'm seeing some hearts. Um, by the way, all of you need to cast a vote. You can't be on the fence here. So are they, they're either the same or they're different, just saying. <laughs> Like, there's no other option, okay? So, you know, I'm seeing some hearts. Well, you know, let me make this a little easier for you. What if I zoom in the picture? Are those the same size and shape, or are they different in size and shape? The, again, the tabletops. Are the tabletops different or the same? So I'm seeing some different, seeing some hearts. 
I'm going to break all of your brains and tell you that they are, in fact, the same size and shape, those two tabletops. So if we were in person, um, this would be when I'd hand out a physical copy of this along with a cutout that you could, in fact, measure and take the piece and move it between the two of them to prove that, in fact, the tops of those tables are the exact same size and shape. Why, why do you think... Um, that we see these as different. And I'd love if you want to unmute yourself and offer your answer, if you want to type in the chat, why do you think when we look at these uh, that we think they are somehow different in size and shape? Perspective. Great. Say more about that. What do you mean by perspective? But yes, I agree. Depending on the way you're approaching something, it can look, you know, where the lighting is or whether you're at the top or the bottom. I mean, I, I think we've learned, some of us have seen selfie pictures or versus pictures of ourselves. And if you get the right light and the right angle, you might look <laughs> different than when someone takes a terrible picture of you. So, you know, you're, it's funny you say that, Taryn. I just read an article yesterday about something called Zoom dysphoria, um, that all of us, and actually this is a documented phenomenon, that by seeing ourselves so much on Zoom, that actually there's an increase in uncomfort or discomfort with our own physical appearance. And there's been a corresponding increase, believe it or not, in plastic surgery because people are seeing themselves all the time, right? And so your perspective makes a big difference. It's a really interesting point, right? I think, you know, your, your point about sort of the perspective and, and the, the, the routineness of it and seeing it is really interesting. Um, Denise typed in the chat, we're all, we're seeing them at a different angle. I think, you know, that I would go on and say, one of the challenges is there's extra information on here that isn't relevant to the question I asked you. And that extra information is the table legs. Um, so, you know, we're, we're representing a three dimensional object in two dimensions. My question was the tabletop, not the table itself. Right. If we look at a three dimensional picture, sure, I'd agree with you. They're different sizes. But the question really is the top of the table as represented on this picture. So, you know, our minds are trained to recognize the whole picture, not the individual piece of the information. And that extraneous information is taking us to a different pathway that has nothing to do with the question that we were actually asked. So, um, so I know many of you have staff that you'll want to replicate this with. We will get to to share a copy of the of the sheet so you can actually print it out and try this, you know, with your own staff. Uh, but the answer is, in fact, the two tabletops are exactly the same, and our visual cues take us in a different way. And that's an example of a visual mind bug. So let's look at some other mind bugs, and I'll, I'll turn this back to you, Michael. Okay. And so one of the other types of mind bugs that the authors discuss is ones that deal with availability um, and anchoring. And so I'm going to give you a couple choices here on, on a few things. So what I want to do is ask you, each year, do more people in the United States die from cause A or cause B? So the first set is murder or diabetes. Um, so again, I mean, you can type in the chat if you want A or B, um, if that's easy. So we're seeing a number of Bs typed in the chat. Yep, I think everyone is pretty much in agreement that B is the answer of choice for this particular. Up, oh, I see one A. Oh, Bridget, she said no. Yep, she's she rejecting. Said, she's rejecting it. All right. So let's go on to the next one. Um, do each year do more people in the United States die from cause A or B? Now it's murder A or suicide B. So I see an A, a B. Kind of we're a little split. So there's some Bs, there's some As. My very unscientific survey would be probably about a 60-40 split here. Maybe more like two-thirds, one-third. Two-thirds B, one-third A. Okay. And then let's do this, this last one here. So again, we're looking at do more die from cause A or B. Cause A is car accidents, B is abdominal cancer. So A or B, the more people die from car accidents, A, or abdominal cancer, B. Uh, I'm seeing more A's on this one than B's. 
So probably about two thirds to you know seventy percent a um, a few bees. All right. So interestingly enough, the answer to all of these, that's your hint, is B, is Bay. B. Anyway, I love Beyonce. So anyway, the answer to all is B. Um, so here's the thing. And this is what I think is very, very interesting. Hey, I just said it was B. You, you just put A. You're not listening. You can't answer the wrong thing. After. All right. No. Um, but yeah, the answer to all of these is B. And it's really interesting. So when we look at murder and diabetes, most people from the data will say B, okay? And the reason being is if you really just ask a lot of people, you know, about people they know who have died, lots of people may know someone who has diabetes, right? Maybe more so than they know someone who's been murdered. So basically, because in our minds, right, what we're, what we're exposed to is, yeah, I know lots of people with diabetes and complications and, and, and whatever else, potential fatalities, you know, maybe not as many that you know of personally who have actually been murdered. Um, when we go into murder and suicide, you start to see a bit of a flip. You start to see more people start pulling toward um, um, the, a, the A side, right? And I will say I've now been doing this for probably, I don't know if it's five years, it's getting very close. Um, this number, more and more people are starting to choose B than A. And I think that is because we're talking more about mental health, especially after COVID. Um, I think more and more people are more open to discussing the fact that they have mental health issues, that they struggle with these things. But in the past, that's been a bit taboo. And so when you look at the statistics from past data, more people knew about murder um, than they knew about suicide, even though suicide is far more prevalent. Um, but again, think about Think about what you see on the news, right? I mean, when the news is talking about what's going on at five o'clock, at 10 o'clock, whenever you're watching the news, they're talking about who was murdered. They rarely talk about the number of suicides, even though probably in your town, far more people committed suicide that night than, than got shot at the 7-Eleven, right? I mean, but that's just what you're seeing. Um, and then you go with car accidents and abdominal cancer. Uh, abdominal can cancer kills far more people than car accidents do. But again, we're going back to the things, the availability of the data that we're getting. And so think about it, you know, at least in the past, before COVID, whatever, on your commute to work, what are, the, what are the people on the news talking about? They're talking about the car accidents, right? In your city, there's seven car accidents in all these different streets, you know, and that's happening every morning and on your way home. Again, on the news, those things are more sensationalized, right? That someone died in a car accident. And you see that. You don't see a lot of specials on the news or on the commute to work about abdominal cancer, although it kills far more people. So again, another mind bug is the fact that what is what information is available to us? What are we seeing on a given time? That information that we're paying attention to, it is crafting part of our decisions, whether we realize it or not. Um, so that's a very interesting mind bug on this one. We're going to go to another example. Um, and this is a situation that the authors talk about from data where basically they took a group of people and they divided them equally and they were in you know separate rooms. They were given different data. But basically what you were trying to do is each group was trying to determine if the data they were given was enough to convince them as a you know fictitious jury whether or not Mr. Sanders um, was driving under the influence. And so for group one, um, they basically were given this information and it said on his way out of the door, Sanders staggered against a serving table, knocking a bowl to the floor. OK, so group one, they only get that data. The second group gets this on his way out the door. Sanders staggered against a serving table, knocking a bowl of guacamole dip to the floor and splattering guacamole on the white shag carpet. OK, so these two groups separated, don't know about the other groups, and they're given this data and they're asked, is there enough data to say that Mr. Sanders was driving under the influence? In group number one, the vast majority, right, say there's not enough data, right? We don't know if he was driving under the influence. All we know is that he staggered against a serving table and a bowl fell on the floor. You know, that could have been a lot of things. You know, someone could have pushed him. He could have not seen it. It could have been a really crowded party. You know, that doesn't mean that the man's driving under the influence, right? But for the group that was given the fact that he knocked over guac dip on a white shag carpet, okay, so I'm going to give you these two images. Think about this. This is your white shag carpet on the right, and this is your guac on the left. 
Imagine cleaning that. That's your house, right? Just the visual images, just those things. The, the, the data here is really the same, right, as far as what happened. The bowl got knocked on the floor, but just adding the, some descriptors of it was guac and it was white carpet, it makes people think that's awful and how gross that would be to clean up. And they're already th thinking these negative things. And because they're thinking negative things, they are less charitable to Mr. Sanders just based on those extra types of descriptors, which is very, very interesting, but that's how we think about things, right? If we start having a negative feeling about something, it influences our judgment, whether or not we're aware of that. So that's just kind of, um, from, from that thing, that's just our introduction to mind bugs um, as a whole. Um, and I'm actually gonna steal this from Daniel's notes, but he basically put something that's from the book itself and it says mind bugs slant how we see remember reason and judge they reveal a particular disparity in us between our intentions and ideals on one hand and our behavior and actions on the other which i think it's a good quote that that daniel captured there do you want to add anything to that one daniel before no i just on? can't get the picture of a white shag carpet with guacamole stains <laughs> out of my head at this point michael so yeah the lesson is don't buy shag carpets I think that's right. I think that's right. So, so Michael gave you a, a, an indication of mind bugs. We're going to talk for a minute about blind spots. So, um, so this is another area the authors in this in this book sort of delve into, um, and they begin this conversation by talking about lies. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna um, give you some color coding around lies, right? So, so you know, how often do we give answers that we know are untrue? I think each of us would say. Generally, we are hopefully truthful people, right? I tell the truth all the time. I tell the truth most of the time, right? But but in reality, if we if we dive into that statement, what how often do we um, you know, do we have a blind spot that we don't recognize ourselves? So so first of all, the example that they use in the book is is what we've known colloquially as white lies, right? And why are they white lies? Presumably because they're they're pure and innocent. Um, and they seem to be harmless, right? So, you know, if someone asks, how are you? And you're having a really terrible day and you say, I'm fine, right? How often is, have you done that? How are you? I'm really terrible right now. No, that's not what you say. You say, I'm fine. Well, that's a white lie, right? You're not really telling the truth about your situation. Um, number two, do I look fat in these jeans, right? Well, you know, there <laughs> again, uh, how often are you is is a spouse or a partner or a friend going to say yes, sweetie? You look fat in those jeans, right? So, so you know the white lie there is presumably harmless, and I think you know we we could argue and have some conversation around the ultimate harmlessness or so-called harmlessness of those lies. But then we turn into what is gray lies, and gray lies um, a little bit darker. They tend to try to. Uh, spare feelings. That's generally the intention here, right? So, so what were you dreaming about when you moaned in your sleep last night? Um, so, you know, again, are you going to tell the truth in that situation? You you may be attempting to spare your partner's feelings. Can you spare a dollar? You're approached on the street. Can you spare a dollar? Well, sure, I could spare a dollar, but am I going to? So what is the truth in that situation, right? What is the truth actually as compared to your answer? Um, or this happens to me all the time. The phone rings. Can I please speak with uh, Mr. Barkowitz? Um, is Mr. Barkowitz at home? Or is Mrs. whatever at home or Ms. whatever at home? Um, no, I'm sorry, they're not. Uh, who is this? Hi, this is, you know, the doctor's office calling. Yes, it's me. Um, so, you know, that gray lie concept of, you know, again, are you giving an answer you know to be untrue? Well, the problem is, you know, these two, if we could dive a little bit deeper, we probably would admit that we're not telling the truth. But here's the difficulty. We can get, and the authors define something they call colorless lies. Um, and I really like this concept as well, because these are things that we can't even see that we're lying. So some examples of when we're giving an answer we know to be untrue but, but we ourselves don't recognize it. So the question, how often do you exercise? Well, I exercise daily. Is that really true? Right? My intention is to exercise daily, but have I really exercised daily? Well, but my intention is to exercise daily, so therefore I, I'm charitable to myself, and I'm gonna say, sure I do, even though the reality is there are lots of days that I don't exercise. 
how many drinks do I have per day? Well, you know, I have one drink a day. Do I really have one drink a day? Would 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 my wine glass agree with that statement, right? So, you know, uh, what, is is it colorless in that I'm not admitting to myself the truth of what's there? And then there's this other category, which again I really like um, that they define, which are what they call blue lies, and these are lies where we know the answer is untrue, but we give the wrong answer because essentially we believe the answer we're giving to be more truthful than the actual truth. So let me give you some examples of that, right? Did you vote in last Tuesday's election? Well, I really didn't vote, but I meant to vote. And had I voted, I would have voted in the way that the election turned out. And I always vote. So therefore, yes, I voted. That's the more essential truth. But the reality is I didn't vote. Right. Did you do all the reading for the last test? Well, I meant to, um, and I always do all the reading. So therefore, yes, I did all the reading for the last test. Um, are you always courteous, even to people who are disagreeable? Of course I am. I'm always charitable. I'm always nice, always, except the time that I wasn't. Um, I always apologize to others for my mistakes. I would declare everything at customs, even if I knew I couldn't possibly be found out. Well, my intention is I would always do that. So, you know, that is the essential truth. But the reality is I forgot, forgot to mention the thing I brought back from my foreign trip. Right? So some more examples of blue lies where it gets a little more uncomfortable, perhaps. Are you racist? Well, interesting, right? Um, uh, the first question here to talk about is what social scientists have been able to measure until about the 30s or 40s, or even into some into the 1950s, people would actually address this quite honestly. Yes, I'm racist. But the challenge is that as we move forward, it has not become uh, societally acceptable to admit. So the are you racist answer, the blue line lie here is no, I'm not racist. But the reality is we're all racist. So how, how you know, the essential truth question here well, you know, paradoxically, I, I, I'm not, I don't act racist. I don't think of myself as racist. So therefore, my answer to that question is no. But what's the truth? Are you homophobic? Right. Um, am I sexist? Um, but then we get into specifics. Are Asian descendants better at math than European descendants? Are men more athletic than women? Should gay men be allowed to serve openly in the military? So in all these questions, we have what we know to be true, and then we have what we say to be true. And we may not even know ourselves that we've provided the lie. So the question that the authors faced is, how do we measure this? How do we get to measure these blind spots when they are truly blind? How do we measure in spite of ourselves? We may be blind, blind to the truth. To the truth. And so we're going to turn to um, the design and the, and the way that we address this next. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, so like what Daniel was hitting on is, is, is anymore you can't just give a survey, right, and find out what people are thinking, um, because most people are answering very charitably of themselves. So um, when I first started doing this, um, lots of people had not heard of the implicit association tests out of Harvard. I am finding that more and more people, um, as bias is being talked about, have, have discovered these. Um, but if you don't know what an implicit association test is, I'm going to show you just kind of a very um, pretty simple example on this next slide. Basically, when you're looking at an implicit uh, association test, kind of imagine that you're given a bunch of cards. OK, like I give you a deck of cards and on these cards, Let's say there, there's these four types of things. So you've got cards that are flower names, right? So you've got orchid, daffodil, rose, etc. Those are on those cards. Then I've given in this also in this deck, you've got insect names, so like flea and centipede, wasp, roach, etc. Um, you've also got pleasant meaning words, so gentle, heaven, love, friend. These are these are these are pleasant. And you've got unpleasant meaning words like damage or vomit or poison or ugly. 
Okay. So just imagine that I have, we're in the room and I've given you this big bundle of cards, right? And they, and they could have any of these four types of things on there. They've got flower names, insect names, pleasant meaning words, and unpleasant meaning words. You can go to the next slide, Daniel. So if I told you, hey, I want you to put your cards into one of two piles. I want you to put the flowers and the pleasant words. I want you to put all of those in one pile. But then I want you to put the insects and the unpleasant words in the other pile. So if I gave you that task very, very quickly, you'd basically be able to put the, the cards in the correct spot. You'd put rose and daffodil and friend and love in one, and you'd have vomit and wasp and roach and poison um, in the other, right? So very quickly, you would sort those cards. You wouldn't even think twice about it. Um, and one of the reasons is because most of us have this kind of implicit association between flowers, right, and pleasantry. Right. I mean, there 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 are, you know, obviously there are exceptions to this. But my thing is, most of the time people have, have a pleasant feeling about flowers. Also, most of the time, unless maybe you just love studying insects, you have an unpleasant feeling about insects. Right. When you notice that there's a spider on your hand, you don't just like look at it and love on it. Right. You you know, you want to get it off. Right? I mean, it's an unpleasant reaction with insects for the most part. So this is kind of how implicit association works. Um, with, with this test. So if I change it up a little bit and I say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put the flowers and the unpleasant words in this pile right over here. And then I want you to put the insects and the pleasant words, you put them in this pile. When people are given this task with the exact same cards, their speed at sorting these piles significantly slows, right? Because your brain, I'm saying do this as fast as possible. Your brain is having to basically disassociate right the fact that it doesn't usually put vomit and rose and roach and love in the same category right it doesn't like that daffodil and poison wasp and friend right i mean the, your brain is like you're unteasing associations as you try to put these things into a pile so this is kind of basically how an implicit association test works it's trying to see how you associate certain things okay so this is pretty benign not a big deal so let's go back to the question, um, well, actually forward, but yeah, but go back to what Daniel talked about in some of these blue lies. And so here's a question that you might find on a survey that you can't get accurate data on because of how charitable people are toward themselves. And so here we are, are black men more violent than white men? If we ask this in Pleasant Company, right, and we're just all chatting and we know it's like we have to give the answer of, oh, you know, no, that's not true. Right. That's what we have to say in polite society. So if everybody's going to answer this as if they don't have this feeling. Right. Then we're not going to get some accurate data. So there's another implicit bias um, or implicit association test that actually goes over things like this. And you can go and go to the next slide. Um, Daniel. Um, so there's one specifically where the the researchers try to look at African-American faces. European American faces, weapons, and harmless items. Okay. So, what they basically did is just what we did before. And we say, okay, in this pile, I want you to put all of the cards that show an African American male face and weapons. And on this other thing, put European American or white American faces and harmless items. So, when you give people these cards, very quickly, they sort these into these two categories. When you ask people, like we did before, to switch it up a bit, and you say, now I want you to put African-American male faces with these harmless items, and I want you to put European or white American faces with the weapons, the vast majority of people significantly slow down because they're having to untease what they cannot admit on the survey, which is an implicit association that they view black men violently. Okay. So that's not something that, you know, we in white society like to talk about a lot, but that, that's the thing. We may not answer it on a survey, but when rubber hits the road on this, when we have to show, prove, right, that our brain doesn't think that way, we're significantly slowed. So let's look at uh, some of the stuff from here. And then this is just one of those, if you want to go back, just one, if you ever want to look at some of these, I think that you all have a copy of the slides. These are uh, just links, the quick links that you can actually take this exam on your own. So if you, 
you know, want to want to test that out, you can. Just so anyway, if you want to go back to that, that's there. But we can go to, on to the, to the next slide. So as we look at all of this, the thing that was very interesting about the data was that 70 percent of people struggled when they were told to place European white American faces with the weapons. Right. They had a whole lot of trouble doing that. Now, here's something that's very interesting about this test. OK, the weapons were like Eurocentric. And what I mean Eurocentric is these are weapons developed by white culture. OK, so let's think about medieval. Think about medieval Europe, which is mostly white. These are things like cannons and bayonets. And I mean, just like old, old things. I mean, that, that white people made. However, however, right, they are struggling to put these weapons of violence with white faces, even though it belongs to their, you know, to their, their historical culture. And so that, that's even more strange, right? These aren't just modern weapons. Um, the next thing, equating African-American faces with weapons was easier among all races. And I thought, I thought that was kind of surprising. Um, but basically, I list them in order here. It is basically easier mostly among whites than Asians and Latinos um, and then finally African-Americans. But my thing is so – but there is a – it's a majority among all of these classifications. Um so that's interesting. So before you go to the next one, Daniel, I would like to know what you all believe, because we're all in education or connected to education. I would like you to tell me um, what, what are what are what are the um, I don't remember what they are. You use the hand. Raise your hand if you think that education has a positive effect on this and put the heart symbol if you think it doesn't. So think about education as people become more educated on these topics. How does it affect these results? So hand hand raise, it improves it, right? People are less biased. Or put the heart icon if you think um, it doesn't have an effect. Got a couple of hands, three hands. Cool. So here is the Four. thing that is disappointing and blows the liberal mind right is that it doesn't there's no effect that can make us feel kind of sad but i, I want to come back to this it, which is here's the thing your implicit associations are very hard ingrained in who you are education doesn't necessarily make those go away what education can do right the positive thing is if we recognize these things we can counter them Right. What education does is says, hey, this is maybe my default reaction. It's there in my brain sometimes, even cobwebbed over a bit, but it's there. And knowing that, how do I adjust? OK, so even though I know it seems disappointing that education doesn't really improve, right, your 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 bias associations in certain areas, because those are kind of some of them are just hardwired from childhood on. I mean, it, it takes a lot to become who we are psychologically. So even though it can't take out that first gut reaction, it can make you have a gut check. So there's a, there's a positive thing to this. So let's go on. Um, well, that's yeah. So that's basically what what IATs are. And I think Daniel, you take over from here. I do. So so I'm going to tell you a story, and I want you to tell me how this story could be true. So um, again, you know, open up your chat window um, and offer some ideas. So here's the story, um, and let's think about how this could be true. Um, so I'll provide you the story. Number one, um, a father and his son are in a car accident. The father dies at the scene and the son, badly injured, is rushed to the hospital. In the operating room, the surgeon looks at the boy and says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How is that possible? So again, a father and his son are in a car accident. The father dies at the scene. Um, the, the the son is badly injured, rushed to the hospital, the operating room, the surgeon looks at the boy and says, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son, how can this be? So we've got uh, mom, stepson, surgeon's mom, right. We are programmed to stereotype. Um, Right. The programming we have here is to stereotype that male equals surgeon. Now, again, you know, this answer is changing. If I told this story 10 years ago, um, there'd be a, a lot more challenge in, in sort of understanding um, and making it work. Um, I would say to you, I think it's interesting. So we have step 
son. Um, we don't have other father. So I think, again, you know, uh, it sort of brings up the point, this could be a family with two fathers. Um, and it's interesting that all of you went to mother as the answer. Um, so, you know, there are lots of ways that in our in our definition of family that it's possible that the that the other parent could be, you know, in the operating room as a surgeon as well. I will also say, you know, we're set up, you were set up in that all the pronouns um, were in, you know, in my story were male. So father, a father dies at the scene, um, his son, he is my son. Um, you know, there's a lot of repetition of father, son, boy, he. So it's programmed to be a male fronted answer. Um, and again, you know, this, this speaks to the idea of stereotyping. We're going to dive a little more into some concepts of stereotyping and how the authors identify this through the course of the book. Okay, so one of the first kind of things is with stereotyping is a lots of time it has a very negative like reaction, right? Look at stereotyping and say, oh, that's not something we should be doing, right? Well, stereotyping is by itself, it's just part of being human, okay? Um, it's something that all of us do, whether we know it or not, because here's the thing, I, don't, I know everybody's you know backgrounds are in different areas. Mine is, is mostly in philosophy or in education. And so when we look at things like philosophy, we talk about often about categories, right? It's just it's how humans survive, is that we naturally like to categorize things because it helps us make decisions, decisions that are oftentimes good for us. Um, so I'll give you just an example. So there's one called sales clerks and credit cards. In this particular type of example, right, if somebody, a stranger, well, here's a, you know, the question is this, would you give your financial data to a stranger? Okay, so if that's the question, most people would say, no, I won't do that. But you think about it. You do that with a sales clerk all the time. That's a stranger. Most of you do not know the person you just handed your very personal financial information to. But you've made that a protected class. You have learned over time that your categorization, your stereotype, is that it's safe to give your financial information to a sales clerk. Even though we know it may not always be the case, right? That sales clerk may be somebody that's skimming your information. But we've categorized that on the whole, right, sales clerks are an okay group of people that we can give that data to, okay? Um, and that's just how life operates. The next uh, example that I put to remind myself is doctors and privacy. So once again, if a stranger asks you to remove all of your clothes, right, you're going to be like, um, no, right? Well, I don't know. Some of you may be those people. I don't know. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not here to judge what you do with strangers. But my thing is, if you're going to a physician for the first time, they've got to look at something. There may be something where they ask you to remove all your clothes, but you put physicians into that protected category of this is a stranger with whom I can do this and still be safe. Right. So, again, you're stereotyping, even though, as we know and we see on the news that there are certain physicians that abuse that. But overall, we categorize them as safe. Um, if you look at a more um, maybe kind of a silly example, but then we've got about ducks and eggs. If you ask any kid on the street and you say, hey, do ducks lay eggs? They're going to say, yeah, they do. Right. They have categorized that ducks, they're egg layers. Well, here's the real data. The real data is that. Half, and I'm sorry, sorry, that the male ducks obviously don't lay eggs. They're ducks, and they never have laid an egg. And then when you look at females, um, oh, well, that's the other thing. The majority of ducks that are born are male, all right? So they're already like a heavier portion of their, of their society. And then you've got a portion of female ducks that are not ready to lay eggs yet. When you actually look in the hole as far as, you know, the duck population, there's a small percentage that are actually egg layers. But we have we have stereotyped that ducks are egg layers, period. Right. Um, and then the last one, and you would see this, this is kind of getting even more silly. But do dogs wear clothes? Most of the time people would say no. But we know there's people that put things there. Um, they're, they're dogs in, in, in clothes. So that's just letting you know that we all have a stereotyped answer to lots of things. And that's how we navigate the world. OK, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that stereotype holds in all situations. Um, you want to move to the next. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, Daniel? Uh, again, I think you know the dog clothing one is an example. Um, is an interesting compared to the duck egg one, right? So, so we we that is a category as well. Some dogs wear clothes, some ducks lay eggs, but it goes back to this idea of how we categorize people or or objects into different into different places and what assumptions we make. 
Um, and you know, there's no, there's no. Um, I go back to the original definition, Michael, about uh, for or against. There's no um, unfairness to this, but or you know, there's no for or against bias here. But there is bias, and that bias becomes evident as we start to sort of dig into, you know, decision making on your part. Um, you know, if you're asked to contribute to a, a foundation for egg laying ducks versus dog wearing or clothes, clothes wearing dogs, you might have a slightly different response because your categories have been created along those ways. Just, it's an interesting topic. So the thing is, the, the, the point on, on that one, just to, to sum up is again, we all stereotype and that is typically our gut reaction is where we're going with that. And that leads us to some really, which what I think is some of the most important things that, that, that this, these particular authors go over. And the thing is, this category, I just call us versus them. Um, you can go on to the next slide if you want. Can I just uh, say before you do, Michael, yeah. sorry, um, the, the, my quintessential example of this one is Dr. S Dr. Seuss story. Many of us have read um, the one about the star-bellied snitches. So um, having kids and having grown up with them on, on um, you know, on Dr. Seuss, uh, it, my, my lesson for you is, is read that read that book again if you have a chance the star bellied snitches um, and you'll get a good sense of where we're going with this well we get to the us versus them category the very first thing that the 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 authors talk about is just is imprinting in both sights and sounds um, and like I said I'm this is not my specialty but I can sum sum it up for you um, basically very early on as infants and children we begin to imprint okay on different types of things okay so that can be on a site or a sound um so you can basically start to recognize the the face of your parents right because they're the ones that potentially you see the most um or the sounds of their voice and other things like that like the the authors talk about silly things like how even um animals imprint very early you can have you can have you know ducks that start following the boots of the farmer or or you know things that are in love with a basketball just because they're imprinting at a young age on the things that are safe to them. Um, as we think about that with animals, if you look at infants, which is this next little thing to remind me of, um, as far as faces and tone of voice, very early as the child is looking up from the crib, it is already starting to make imprints um, of the faces that it sees. Um, and again, the voices that are around it. So the interesting thing with this is and I, and I need charity on this one, but basically, and this is changing as society changes, but I am a white person, as it is, is noticeable, and both of my parents are white. So basically, as I grew up, my siblings are white, my grandparents are white, I am used to seeing white um, um, as, as, as a human being. That's all that was, was basically around me, which means that as we are children, remember we're trying to categorize because we're trying to put things into categories. I'm trying to differentiate faces. If all of the faces around me growing up are white, then as I'm looking to distinguish grandpa from mom, from brother, from aunt, right? I'm looking at the changes in the features of these people's faces. Maybe mom has long hair, right? Maybe dad has a, has a, has a goatee. Maybe somebody's got blue eyes and somebody's got brown. But the one thing as a child I'm not using to differentiate the people around me is whiteness. Right? Because that's not a difference. Everyone around me is white. So I'm looking at differences in the size of a nose or the shape of a, of, of anything. So children are all already doing things like this. Um, which means that over time, if I'm introduced to a black person, right, that I am less good at differentiating one black face from another. And that sounds like a very racist thing to say. I think we've all heard basically racist people say, I don't know about this Asian population, right? I can't tell one from another. And we look at that as a very racist thing to say, but actually the data supports the fact that if you are from a homogenous home where there's not a lot of difference, you actually find that humans struggle to identify the faces of basically people that are different than they are. Um, and I think that's really, really interesting. There's a, not this book, but another one, and this is a black female in California who she studies this stuff. Um, she has her PhD in all of this, but she tells a story about how she was raised in an entirely black neighborhood 
And then she started going to a white school uh, for high school. And she talks about struggling making friends. She said not because the white folks around her were mean, but because she would never under remember like, oh, was that the one that invited me to the sleepover or was it her? She couldn't remember the names because she had trouble distinguishing one white girl from another. So the thing that's interesting is we're already imprinting here as far as our clans, our us versus them thing. OK, um, and so, again, the same thing with tones of voice. They also find that children from, let's say, mixed race homes, they don't have that same problem. So, so you've got children, if they're exposed to a very multicultural group of faces, they don't struggle like those of us who grew up in like very homogenous race homes. Um, so we actually already see that there's some reality in the fact that depending on what you're exposed to and what you're not, um, that's just part of early, early, early development. And if you think about children in the way that they're raised, from an early perspective, a child can tell you what their sex is, what their race is, what their religion is. I mean, if you really think about this, most children aren't don't have the brain capacity to fully even understand the religion they're in. But by Lordy, they know if they're Catholic or Protestant or Muslim, right? Because that's their clan. That's who they're around. That's what they do. Same thing about wealth. You know, I mean, kids know if they're rich or poor. So there's lots of things that, that kids don't fully understand, but you start to understand very early on these imprints of things about our race, our sex, our religion, our politics, our wealth. All of that is kind of imprinted uh, very quickly. One of the studies that the authors talk about is where they basically looked at the neural pathways and looked at different areas um, with people in their thinking. And so as they would look at different areas that lit up, if someone is thinking about themselves, and we've covered this several times today, but you know, most of the time people think about themselves very charitably, okay, and then the way that they respond to things. And as I'm thinking about myself in hypotheticals or whatever else, I'm thinking about myself in a certain part of the brain. And if and I'm talking about myself, that area lights up this charity toward myself. When you start talking about people who are like you, or that you assume are like you, friends or family or people from whatever tribe that we look at, whether it be your political party or your religion um, or your club, when you are asked hypotheticals about people that you that you like, you think about them in the exact same place in your brain that you think about yourself. It's kind of like a protected charitable area in your brain where you assume that that person, right, is, is, is you extend charity to them. They find that for people that are outside of your group, however you want to define that, we're all in hundreds of groups, right? But if you look at people outside of your group, you are more likely that other areas of your brain are lighting up. And these are areas where you're not charitable. And the example that I give to you about this, and I, I don't mind exposing, you know, um, um, an anecdote with myself. But when I first when I first did this presentation, um, Sure. It was it was. Do you remember the, the the election? And it was like in it was in Alabama and it was a Senate runoff. But there was was it the, the Roy guy? Am I making this up? The Roy. Anyway, somebody someone in Alabama, there was a runoff. Right. Um, and there was a guy um, running for Republican. His name was Roy something. Um, and there had been allegations that that he had um, a I don't know, dated underage girls or something. I think that's basically what it was. Um, I will go ahead and admit the fact that I am a gay man and I typically, typically vote Democrat, right? Um, when these allegations came up, in my mind, I'm like, that guy's that guy shouldn't run. Absolutely, he should step down. He shouldn't be running for Senate. There's no way, whatever else. My mind immediately raced because he had made disparaging comments about the LGBT community. I see him as not one of us, not one of my party, not one of my sexuality, and I see him as an enemy. So when an allegation comes out against him, my gut, my implicit association is to distrust that man and that he needs to not run. It was a few months later that the allegations came out about Al Franken, right? He's a Democrat, LGBT friendly. And when that happened, I'm like, whoa, let's slow down, right? We need to see the evidence. We need to see the evidence about Al Franken first. And that ex that anecdote shows you what I'm trying to say here is that the thing that's interesting, and I have to admit this to myself because my gut will always run to my implicit associations. But I basically said, Roy, I cut you off. I don't care what the evidence is. Right. And for Al, I'm like, well, let's be charitable. Let's make sure we do things like that. So that's just an anecdote to let you know how how this us versus them thing rolls. Do you want to carry on next, Daniel? 
Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that, Michael, and your and your willingness to share that because I think it's important to see this in practice and in practicality. And and the authors actually give another example. Um, they talk about uh, the case of Carla's hand, and you might you might make the argument that you know Michael's vote or voice didn't really matter in those cases because you know living where he lives, he's not voting in the Alabama election. He's not you know involved necessarily in in California politics, but but how does this translate sort of from a gut punch or a gut feeling to a real strong impact? And so here's an example the authors give of, of what they call Carla's hand. And this is a story right from the book. Um, so uh, a woman named Carla was washing a crystal bowl when it slipped from her hands and it broke and it slit her palm open. And so her boyfriend drove her to the Yale New Haven Hospital um, to get it handled. And at the ER, the boyfriend said to the doctors, you know, it's really important in the attending um, nurses, it's really important that we take care of this because, you know, Carla loves to quilt and quilting is really important to her and it might limit her ability, her activity in the future. And the ER doctor said, well, I'll, I'll stitch that up really quickly. I'll take care of it. So, you know, we, th there was a treatment available. Well, as they were about to start the stitching, um, a student volunteer walked in and saw Carla and said, Carla, um, you know, you're my faculty member at Yale. What are you doing here? Um, why are you in the hospital? And the doctor said, wait, you're a faculty member at Yale? And the doctor called in the best hand surgeon in Connecticut to handle the injury. So, you know, I go back to the point I think we raised at the beginning, which is, you know, that bias of the us, the in my group, highly educated, connected, high, you know, highly trained, you're in the charitable section, I'm going to treat you somehow differently than I might treat everyone else. I'm not being biased against anyone, but I'm giving you a, a, a higher level of treatment or a higher consideration. And that higher consideration of being in favor is itself a bias and has definitive impacts if that student hadn't seen Carla, she may have lost the use of her hand um, or the fine sort of quilting motion that she needed. But in reality, the student saw her and said, you're a faculty member. And all of a sudden, the treatment options and what was offered were different. Um, and that's a pretty clear indication of, of, of bias, I, I feel. Michael, anything you want to add to that before we go on? No, you're good. So again, this idea of you know, uh, of of um, the in-group and the out-group. And the authors say discrimination of even the most apparently well-intentioned kind. I'm doing this because I want to help someone. Helping members of my in-group, that has a significant impact on those who are in the in-group, but also those who aren't in your in-group. And so, um, you know, here here's their, their quote. And I really, again, find this very, very interesting. Um, and their radical suggestion is that it's less and less about explicit acts of aggression in our in our current culture. It's more and more about helping or giving a hand up to those in your in-group. And that's the piece that we really want to be careful of and identify and address, is how do our biases prejudice in favor of someone because they're like us or they're in that sort of us group rather than the them group. So if we were doing this in person, um, one of the things that we've done is we've actually had in the past some sample professional judgment cases that we would pass out and we'd have us look at them together and sort of make some, some decisions or some ideas about what we think you know, might, might have impact. Um, because we're not in person and in the interest of time, we're going to skip over these. But I will, when we distribute the final copy, we'll give you some examples of the scenarios that we've, we've talked about and used in the past. Um, as a way to sort of contextualize this. Um, but we wanted to be respectful of your time. We've taken about an hour. Um, so, uh, Michael, anything you want to say? I'm going to give some resources, but anything you want to say as we move to start to close? No, the only thing I would just want to say is, is thanks for having us. And again, you know, I, I admitted my politics, but my thing is there really isn't a political bend here the entire purpose of this presentation was to try to understand the people that I disagreed with, right? That I still found were good people. And then, and in the long run, the more we, 
the more we've had this presentation, the thing that's interesting to me is when it's all over and we're in person, lots of people stay behind and just start sharing stories about things that they had never faced or, or thought about before. And so the only purpose that Daniel or I have in, in this presentation is just, I believe that factually, you know, it's hard to dispute that we, we do, we are biased, right? I mean, we, we are, and, that, and there's th certain things we can't help. But like I said before, while education doesn't get rid of sometimes our gut checks, I'm sorry, our, our gut feelings, we have the opportunity to check those feelings and start looking at where we are a part of, you know, processes and systems and policies that potentially have been built from our in-group and are potentially harming those are in the out group. And so I think from an educational perspective where you're working on policy or you're making a decision about, you know, a student's future based on their, their past performance, I think it's extremely important when we talk about diversity is, and this is what I tell, you know, folks that I work with in the financial aid office is like, you know, diversity is often just like a buzzword, but I'm like, it's so critically important that as we're making decisions, if we can't connect with a student, if we don't empathize with their situation because they don't know, we can unfortunately harm them. And I'll give you one last thing that I want to just share with you um, from my own experience. But I grew up in a situation where I didn't know anything about poverty. OK, I mean, I just I was I was middle, very strong middle class and that was not something that affected me. But I was on a committee to look at satisfactory academic progress appeals and where a student was claiming that the reason that they dropped out of school was because they had a flat tire. Because of my in-group and where I was, I thought that was the most foolish reason that anyone could ever give. In my mind, I thought, how in the world, you know, can you just drop a whole semester because you have a flat tire? Because in my mind, in my mind, all I had to do is call my parents and that tire would have been fixed. Later in my life, I now live in a neighborhood that is very economically depressed and I have seen cars that get a flat tire and stay there for a year. And as I start to be exposed to things, right, I start to feel really, I don't mean guilty in a way that I like cry. And my thing is I feel guilty about the fact that there's been times I've been in a position to make decisions and have made poor decisions because of my lack of exposure to what other people go through. And so as I've gotten older and I've experienced more things, I've had to be like, you know what, that flat tire is detrimental and can wreck an entire semester for the right type of student. And so I have had to become far more engaged with people who are different than I am, who have different thoughts about I am, even people I disagree with. But my thing is, I think it's really, really important is if we're going to radically do well for each other and one another is we've got to have a diversity where we are willing to say, you know what, the way it was for me isn't the way I have to judge everybody around me. Maybe I need to learn a little more to ensure that as I'm practicing professional judgment, I'm doing it well. Um, and that means I need a community around me to help me have a more holistic opinion. Um, when I when I when I did this presentation, when I first did it, that was my entire intent was just to connect lots of us who feel very differently and to understand that we need the diversity of, e of each other to understand life better. Um, I hope maybe something that we've said today has made you think twice about something that you think about. Um, I'm not here to lecture, change your politics or anything else. It's just. I hope that you leave at least thinking that as you make decisions, potentially there's areas that you should check yourself. And if and if we've succeeded in that, then I'm happy. And I, I will echo that. Uh, you know, the, the example you prompted, Michael, th make, leads me to think about one of the biases I had, which is around language use. So, you know, my I, I know early in my career when I saw someone misspell or mistype or use the wrong grammar or not be careful with their English in a, in a written appeal, I would automatically discount that appeal. I would say, student didn't take the time to work on this. Um, it's not important to them. It's clearly not, you know, it, it, that, that would be a demerit in my mind. Um, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna appeal, you need to be putting your best foot forward. And that's changed in my opinion as well, right? Trying to understand sort of where the student is in their process um, and, you know, and the other piece that I keep on wrestling with is this this need to ask people to relive their trauma. Um, you know, we live in a world in the financial aid space where we ask people to prove, you, you mentioned income inequality, prove they're poor again and again and again. But we also ask people who've been through trauma to document that trauma again and again and again. I think about students who we do dependency overrides for 
who every year it's like, okay, take me through your trauma again. Walk me through why we should be giving you the benefit of the doubt here. And, you know, that that itself can be can be traumatizing for students. And so, you know, trying to understand, obviously, I want to live and work in a world where I'm compliant with what's required of me. And I want to not create harm in the spaces in which I travel. And so, you know, it's, it's prompted me to start looking at my own policies and practices at the college in terms of how we reach out to students and how we help students. You know, we've we've talked about, for example, do we offer students who are submitting SA, you know, SAP appeals the opportunity to have their appeal letter proofed uh, by us? And then, you know, so you turn in your appeal letter, we're going to proof it, we're going to give you some responses, and then as part of our process, we're going to say, this is your draft appeal letter, now turn in your final appeal letter. You know, have a review process where we give you feedback to help students in that process. What would that look like? So, you know, how can we address our policy considerations? You know, if you run an appeals committee, um, do you take the names of the individuals off the appeals you're submitting around um, so that, you know, um, you might not, you know, you might, you might not even know you have a bias around the name, but if I look at, I'm going to make a name up, if I look at a Muhammad applying versus, a, you know, versus an Abraham versus a Jesus versus a Michael, what, what assumptions am I going to make about that person just based on their name? Um, and how do I remove that? potential layer of bias. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be discussed and a lot of ways that we can have impact here. So we've given you a couple of resources. Again, you'll have a full copy of this handout. Um, the implicit.harvard.edu site is where the implicit association tests are. You can read more about the research. You can buy the book. Um, the select a test link gets you all the different tests that they've uh, managed, and I think they've actually added some since I made this list. Um, so feel free to take a look. Uh, you can take the individual tests and see, even if you're in the in group, um, you know, I'll admit that uh, you may have, or you know, I may have bias um, around religion, even though I'm of a minority religious group. Um, I have bias around religion that is not in favor of my minority religious group. So it's really eye opening to sort of take a look at some of these tests. And the last one that we've referenced here is the Kerman Institute. Kerman Institute at The Ohio State University. Notice I said The Ohio State University. Um, the Kerman Institute has a wonderful project on understanding implicit bias, where they'll do what they call a bias cleanse, um, where you can sign up for daily updates and, and emails to sort of prompt you to think about your own biases. So, so those are um, some references that we'll provide. Um, I think we have time. I'm looking to you, Ed and Deshay. I think we have a little bit of time. If people want to offer any questions or feedback, um, we're happy to take that now. Uh, we had hoped to do about an hour 15, and we're almost at an hour 10. So questions or feedback or comments from anyone um, that you'd like us to address. In terms of some uh, change that we can make within our offices right off the bat, what would you recommend is either a, an initial resource or initial training or just a conversation that can be had that might make an immediate difference as we go into, you know, the next cycle of FAFSAs coming through that are going to have a lot of professional judgments, especially with the pandemic? I mean, I... I, let, let me, I'll say one thing. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of this, but I just finished a task force with NASFA on an implicit bias toolkit. Um, it's not perfect, but it did include a lot of people in there with a lot of good ideas from anything about policies, um, the way the committee should be, lots of things. But that is available on NASFA's uh, um, website. And it, it, it's I think it's pretty much free and open to everybody who's there. It's a good place to start. It's a good conversation starter. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, Daniel, do you, yeah, the place I, to start, I would, that's the tough one. <laughs> I would say, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is if you can, uh, handle appeals by committee, we're trying to do them by committee because that does address removing an individual bias. If not, the other thing, and we're, we're such a large place that it's very difficult for us to do by committee. So instead what we're doing is we're going back and pulling a random assortment and having our assistant directors review them 
um, so that we're doing some after action review and then coming back and sharing that after action review with the team as a whole. And so we're making folks aware that this is part of our consideration is that we, we do want to try to eliminate. I think even having the conversation as a staff begins to address it. Um, you know, the one that I struggled with when I was at, um, at MIT, I worked at MIT uh, as director of financial aid. And one of the issues that I struggled with is that the average income of our applicants was higher than the, the average income of my staff. And so there was often an assumption of, well, they have plenty of resource. They should be able to handle it. And even addressing that, just naming that and saying, you know, for a family that earns 400000 a year, um, and we all may dream of earning 400000 a year as a family, but for a family who earns $400,000 a year, a $70,000 income loss is a major reduction in income, right? We might think, well, you're still earning 330000 good for you. But the reality is, you know, when you're facing a $70,000 a year expense, like at MIT, that is a huge difference and has a huge impact on that family. So I think sometimes just naming the issues and owning them is important as well and bringing that awareness to your staff. And, and if I had, you know, like I said, if I had any other recommendation, it's, it's just what we did today, which is, I mean, I think it's interesting to start with just benign data, right, that we just see. And it's like, this is interesting. That is true. And then kind of moving into people to have a safe space to share. Because I think if you really feel like you have a safe space to share, you can actually go through your own stories, right? And the own things that you've been through and share those with others and they feel comfortable to do the same. And you can say, okay, that now that we know that we have these problems, how do we make a better office? How do we ensure that we're not disenfranchising people because they may not, you know what I mean? Be just exactly like us. I mean, I think, I just think it takes honest discussion and I think it takes, an ability to change, right? An ability to, to recognize that maybe I have some things I need to learn. And I, I think that's different for everybody, but I do. I just always start with data and then I move to heart because I think that's, that's to me been the most, I don't know. The, I don't know what to say there. <laughs> been the most helpful. Other, other questions or comments? Um, thank you, Shauna, for your note in chat, by the way. Michael, I don't know if you can read mm. what Shauna typed, um, but she said it's something they've been discussing at their district recently regarding disciplinary placements. Mm. It's so appropriate in so many areas of education. Um, so thank you. And thank you to all of you. Um, I just I want to say again and publicly acknowledge, uh, Michael, your work on this is just so important. And I thank you again for for leading me down this pathway. Um, I know I know. I have so much more to learn, um, and it's embarked on me a desire to really confront and address my own biases. And so um, publicly, I'll again recognize you and thank you for the, uh, for the partnership in this work and the leadership in this work. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Next time, let's try to do this in person together, shall we? Yeah, as opposed to trying to do this virtually. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Daniel and Michael, for your time and, and for what you shared. I know um, personally there's a lot of things that are rolling around in my mind and and things that uh, that uh, um, I, I think, you know, related to work and other things. But but I think it, it's great to be reminded of, um, you know, how do we uh, work in the best interest of our students and use this um, idea that we have the ability to make judgments uh, but we do it in in a way that's appropriate um, with the vast considerations. But I am thankful uh, for the opportunity for us to have professional judgment and the ability to uh, address situations on a case by case basis, despite the fact that there might be some flaws in how we do it. Uh, the fact we have it is is I think uh, uh, the right thing. Um, and just how can we do it right, I think, is is exactly what you've reminded us of. So thank you for your time um, and uh, wish you the best uh, where you're at and in what you're doing. And yeah, maybe we'll be together sometime soon. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take both. Bye bye. Uh, I think I, I do want to move forward with the agenda and, and possibly get through uh, the next two agenda items, just given the fact we have external uh, individuals that uh, are joining us, and then uh, we'll take a break after that. 
Um, but uh, next on our agenda, uh, uh, item E is a presentation about the Texas Grant Annual Report. Our presenter is Andy Thomas, um, and she is uh, the data management and analyst uh, uh, assistant director there at uh, Student Financial Aid Programs. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, let me pull up my screen real quick. Um, that was a great presentation, a lot to think about. Okay, all right, as you said, I will be talking about the Texas Grant Report today. Um, I am Andy Thomas, I'm the Assistant Director of the Data Management Analysis and SFAP. And the Texas Grant Program Report was approved by the board in the July meeting. I believe a copy of the full report was provided in your meeting handouts. But today I'm going to be giving a quick overview and sharing a few highlights from the report. This year's report focuses on fiscal years 2018 through 2020. This first slide is a chart that we have been including in the report for the past few years. It shows the percentage of students who are eligible for an initial grant by pathway. It also shows the percentage of students who received an initial Texas grant by pathway. As you can see, for the last three years, only 65% of students were eligible through the high school pathway, yet this is the pathway from which over 90% of the students who received grants came from. In FY 2020, 426.5 million was granted to over 82,000 students. This is an 11% increase in dollars dispersed from 2018. The average grant amount in FY 2020 was $5,158, which still leaves 47% of average tuition and fees at public universities not covered. This slide shows initial year recipients by basic eligibility and priority model. As you can see, the overall number of initial year recipients has increased each year, and the percentage of recipients who are meeting the requirements for the priority, for the priority model is also gradually increasing. Here is a graph of Texas grant recipients by race and ethnicity and how the percentages compare to overall student enrollment at public universities. The Hispanic and white student percentages are very close to each other in the total student population. However, a larger percentage of Hispanic students continue to receive Texas grants than white students. These pie graphs show percentages of Texas grant recipients by estimated family contribution amounts. Percentage breakout is consistent through the years. Looking at the blue pie slices, we can see that over 50% of students have a zero EFC. If we combine the green and blue slices, 75% of students have an EFC of $2,000 or less. This illustrates that the Texas grant program is reaching the neediest students. These tables display retention in the Texas Grant Program. The top chart shows the percentage of students who receive Texas grants through basic eligibility, and the bottom chart shows the percentage of students who receive Texas grants through the priority model. It is clear that recipients from the priority model stay in the Texas Grant Program at a higher rate than recipients who entered through basic eligibility. With the exception of one cell, there is at least a 10 percentage point difference for the first three retention years between basic and priority models. And that was basically a very quick overview. To, are there any questions? Okay, well, I think there was a report in the meeting handouts. If not, we can make sure we send you a link to the full report. Yeah, I, I guess the only question I, I have for you, Andy, as well as maybe for others, is is there anything in this report that kind of 
jumps out at you um, that, you know, as as we are administrators of this aid program based on the current uh, um, guidelines and, and, and parameters we have, uh, as well as I don't know if it's from you or someone else, any any sense of the reaction um, that, uh, uh, you know, legislators or, or others uh, have of of this information. Um, well, I do know, and I'm not sure if I mentioned in the first slide where we're talking about the um, the high school pathway. Um, we were the coordinating board received funds, gear funding to conduct a transfer grant pilot program. Um, this would focus on supporting transfer students because that is definitely an area um, that we're not reaching. And so, um, like I said, there's a transfer pilot program going on and um, it has to, the funding has to be spent by June 22, 2022. So um, this is definitely a population we're trying to serve, we're trying to get better at. Um, I don't know the reaction of, um, I, I don't have, I wasn't involved in a lot of the, the meetings with the legislation, so I don't really know there on their reaction. Yeah, I think I think you're highlighting, you know, the one point and, and again, bringing up these gear funds, which we'll hear a little bit more about as well as, uh, you know, I do recall there was even some proposed legislation in this last uh, round um, to try to address, you know, the transfer population and and mm -hmm. all of that. Um, right. What right. I'm wondering, I mean, the standard, uh, I guess, answer that I feel like we've provided in this is the reason why there is this disparity is it's a lack of funding um, in the program. Um, and so, you know, we are prioritizing a population that it, it seems right. But if there were more funds available, those funds would likely flow to um, these other pathways as eligibility. And I don't know, you know, there's a committee feel that still is the the valid primary point of why this is the way it is or or is there maybe more that insight that uh, we might have uh, for the coordinating board um, for you know for kind of decision makers in um, seeing how maybe these other pathways could be uh, uh, prioritized more than what they appear to be in in how this is playing out based on the realities of what we're working with. I see Robert has his hand up. Yeah, so to your point, Ed, about uh, having enough funding to go around, and uh, and I guess my question to you, Andy, is uh, does we see that 95% of those recipients uh, are coming from the 65% high school uh, pathway. Mm -hmm. However, are we funding 100 percent of that 65 percent eligible population? If we're not, we're going to have to add a lot more funding to be able to prioritize the funds for that. So have access funds to to give to the associate and TOG pathway. Right. Um, yes, that's not 100 percent. That um, not that there was about 35,000 who are eligible through the high school pathway and 30,000 who actually received it through the high school pathway. So that's 88% who actually received it. So yeah, it's not enough funding for even that pathway. Any other thoughts, reactions? Um, I guess one one I'll just state one concern I have um, with the idea of addressing you know these associate and TEGO pathways. Um, I'm concerned about redirecting the limited funds we have and forcing us to use those dollars in other ways. With the point that you you know uh, uh, identify that even in the high school pathway we're not able to meet all of those needs. And so, um, you know, I guess I would hope there would be 
uh, as much consideration with more funding versus saying, hey, we're going to shift funding and uh, prioritize others and meaning we have the ability to serve a population, you know, one population um, less because we're trying to serve another population. I, I but but I know that's the tension with limited resources, but um, right. that's that's that that is I think something. So I I you know the idea that there are at least some pilot funds to try mm -hmm. to address this, um, you know, is better than something that says you've got to take a certain percentage if you're at a four-year public and use it for other models and then um, find ourselves not able to serve. Uh, you know, uh, all of the students who who are eligible. Arnold, you've got your hand up. Y yes, sir, I sure do. Uh, um, Ed, I just want to echo what you just said, because I think that most of my colleagues around uh, this this meeting uh, fully agree um, in terms of um, uh, ed adequately funding the program to where we don't get into uh, a, in, into the deficit model, you know, trying to shift funding from one bucket to the other bucket. Um, so I, I I always approach these things by by identifying the unmet needs of the program. I, I I'd like you know, uh, for example, um, for us to to identify at the state level what that unmet need is for, to fully fund the Texas program. And, and, and maybe that's already been done, but I think we need to focus on the additional funding um, because we, you know, we, we do want to take care of the, the, the kids that come out of high school, but I'm also concerned from a four-year perspective I want to increase my transfer students and and so on and so forth. And I think I speak for for all of us. Um, but something, um, Andy, that you mentioned that uh, a, a takeaway that that jumped at me. Uh, and and please clarify here. Um, you said that that even with this funding, we're we're covering forty seven percent of the or forty forty seven percent of the tuition and fees are not not covered is that a correct statement that you mentioned or that it covered 47 percent no it's not covering so the average grant amount right the recommended amount is five thousand the average grant amount actually dispersed is 5100 but the average tuition and fees at a public university is about 9700 so right. therefore there is still um 47 percent of average tuition and fees not being covered by the grant amount itself Right, and, and 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 you know, certainly to to our legislators, I would say I really appreciate how much Texas grant funding we're getting. But look at all these, look at the need, and that's where I'm heading with the unmet need model. We're not serving all the students that are eligible. Number one, number two, where we we have almost half the tu of the tuition and fees is not being covered. So I think we have a great business case to present, um, you know, and again, not, a, not I, I, I don't want to come across as we don't appreciate because we do, um, but we, we need more and we need to continue us as financial aid professionals continuing the charge of being advocates for additional funding and see it as an investment, not as an expenditure. But uh, again, Andy, thank you so much for your report. I I loved it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Very good points. Any other reactions, um, observations, questions? I see a hand, Dee Dee. Kind of echoing what Arnold was saying is that as that amount, the recommended award stays at 5,000 and tuition fees continues to increase, the institutions have to match, right? So that is less funding that is available to our non-Texas grant eligible students. So that becomes 
a challenge every year in trying to balance the needs of all the, pop, the needy students that we have. So it would be really great if there were some additional funding where that recommended award was higher. Okay. Denise, I see your hand. Um, thank you, Ed. Um, Andy, did you, you may have said this, but did you get a reaction from this report? Not that I'm aware of. Um, Deshay, I don't know if you were present at the board meeting, but I have not, I've not received any feedback um, on, on a reaction. So I can speak with Chad. I know Chad has closer um, contact with this, so I can, I'll definitely speak with Chad on that, but I'm not aware of a reaction. Just we'll so that um, we're doing all that we can do right. to definitely do what we can as far as our students populations are concerned um just so that that the legislature and the powers that be know that hey this is what we're dealing with and this is the reality because mm -hmm. i know they see the big picture and they see the numbers and they see all right. that hey, you've got plenty of of numbers here and and yes we do we got plenty of dollars for this much mm -hmm. so that's just that was my point yeah, you know, we're definitely. I definitely took down some of the comments that were made uh, amongst the committee members to go back and look at some, you know, other ideas as we're, you know, approaching with the next legislative session. And so that's where it's always good to get this kind of feedback. Um, we'll definitely go back and, you know, see uh, what it looks like for different, you know, models. Um, like what was recommended as far as the recommended dollar amount specifically on, you know, Texas grant. Um, so I think every one in the comments that were made are very valid and having to work with a small amount of money for a large population of needy eligible students, you know, like you said, it's very tricky. And so, you know, this particular legislative session allowed for additional funding in all three uh, grant programs. And so that will help serve more students, but there's still much more, you know, to uh, serve out there. And so definitely we'll look at, you know, what the committee has to say and, and see where we can move forward as an agency. And I think this was addressed a little earlier, having to look at different ways of funding sources in other programs that might be able to benefit other students that uh, these other three grant programs can't. And so we'll, you know, definitely probably go into a few of those during the year, but definitely looking at other opportunities out there for those who are underserved in other areas. Thanks. Well, again, thank you, Andy, for um presenting this information and, and the work I'm, I'm sure that was went behind uh, uh, putting together this information and being able but, to make it available to us and others. Was there someone else? Nope. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. Thank you. So that's okay, let's move on to the next uh, agenda item, item F, uh, which is external relations and John Wyatt, um, our director of external relations for the coordinating board. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Getting some nods, so that's good. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm John Wyatt, uh, Director of External Relations here at the Coordinating Board. Uh, so I'm going to present a bit of an update on where things stand with the legislature, uh, as well as kind of a high-level update on the Federal uh, Governor's Emergency Education Relief, or GEAR funds, um, that have been dispersed. Uh, as you know, uh, the legislature is currently in its second special session uh, since the adjournment of the regular session, which ended at the, uh, the end of May. So under the Texas Constitution, the governor can call the legislature into special sessions for up to 30 days at a time. Uh, and he also gets to specify what topics may be addressed during that special session. Um, that's called his call. So when he calls them into session, he can say, you know, these are the topics um, that you're, you're allowed to uh, pass legislation on. Um, so for the current special session, the governor did not include uh, any financial aid topics um, on his call. Uh, and the current special session uh, has to adjourn by September 5th, uh, 
um, and that's this Sunday. Um, so they're they're going to wrap things up pretty pretty soon here. Um, however, we do anticipate that there will be at least one more special session uh, called um, later this fall. Uh, and that's because they have kind of two big issues left on the table um, that they need to address. Uh, the first is legislative redistricting um, that was delayed uh, due to the delay of census data uh, being released. Um, and so they're going to have to, that data is now available. Um, so they're going to have to get together to uh, redraw their legislative districts. Uh, and the other issue they need to address is the disposition of about $16 billion um, in federal stimulus funding um, that was allocated to Texas. Um, so that funding was provided to Texas through the American Rescue Plan, uh, which was passed by Congress and signed by President Biden earlier this year. Um, the state has pretty broad latitude over how it chooses to use those funds. And so the legislature is going to have to make some decisions um, about how those funds are going to be invested um, across the entire range um, of state programs. Uh, and, and I'll also note about these funds. So these funds are distinct and in addition to the federal gear funds uh, that Texas has received. So they're, they're both federal stimulus funds, but they're two separate pots of money um, that Texas has access to. Um, in regards to gear, um, so gear uh, specifically has to be spent on primary, secondary, and higher education. Um, and uh, as you know, last year, uh, Governor Abbott and the legislative leadership uh, announced the investment of about $175 million in gear funds uh, to the coordinating board. And that was used to uh, maintain our existing uh, state financial aid programs. Uh, to provide emergency aid and reskilling upskilling grants, uh, as well as to fund online support and data infrastructure investments. So that that came out in summer of last year. Uh, we're very grateful that in June of this year, um, Governor Abbott uh, and the legislative legislative leaders announced a further investment of ninety four point six million dollars in gear funding to support higher education. Uh, I, I believe you've been provided uh, in your materials an overview um, of where and how those funds in the latest round are going to be invested. Um, but a couple of things to, to highlight. Um, these funds will be used to help uh, institutions uh, establish and expand programs that address workforce demand in high priority sectors or occupations for regional and state economic development. Uh, so this includes an investment of up to $25 million to support uh, workforce training programs that lead to industry certifications or other credentials in high demand fields. So uh, this effort is consistent with the Texas Reskilling and Upskilling Through Education or TRUE initiative. Um, that was legislation that was passed by the, uh, the legislature in their, their regular session. Uh, so there's also a focus that, that was touched on in, in Andy's presentation on using these one-time funds to uh, support pilot or to pilot novel innovative approaches to financial aid. Um, specifically, um, GEAR funds will support the creation of a Texas Leadership Scholars uh, pilot program uh, designed to encourage high-achieving, low-income high schoolers uh, to take advantage of educational opportunities in, in Texas colleges and universities. Um, and it's also going to pilot the creation of a Texas transfer grant uh, program that will provide portable uh, need-based aid for those high-achieving, low-income transfer students. So really a focus on kind of using these funds that are, it's, it's a one-time shot with these, um, but to pilot some, some kind of new innovative approaches. Um, you may have also seen that uh, last Friday, uh, we announced the availability of gear-funded reporting modernization grants. Um, so these provide public institutions with grant awards to update and improve their reporting systems, their data reporting systems. Um, it can support technology purchase, contract support, um, or compensating staff um, for their time spent improving those systems. Uh, so across all of this gear funding, um, staff at the agency are working very diligently to finalize details that will allow us to get these funds out the door and to their intended recipients. Uh, we want to do that as quickly as possible, while at the same time ensuring that we fully comply uh, with state and federal standards and requirements uh, for using these funds. Uh, we will continue to communicate with you and with your institutions um, as additional gear funded programs come online. Um, 
And with that, uh, and with the caveat that I'm I'm not really the expert on the specifics um, of these uh, these gear funded programs, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I think the only you know kind of thought I had, and, and John, you mentioned um, you know the ability to answer, and maybe Deshe as well. But you know when you said soon we'll be getting kind of actual guidance of how you know these are really going to play out and what we need to do. Can you define soon any more than you're working hard to get it done as soon as possible? I'll I'll let you handle that one, Deshe. And you're correct. I don't have an exact timeline, um, but we're definitely going to get information out. We're still working through all the logistics, specifically on that transfer grant. So there is a number of individuals within the agency that are trying to pull together and kind of flush out some of the logistics and how to ensure that these funds can get spent within the time frame that we're allotted. So yes, more information to come what soon actually means as far as scheduling time is it a month or two you know hopefully you know well before the end of the calendar year um, we should have everything pretty finalized and be able to provide more information and what that looks like for your institutions ed but the more i gain and know the more i will certainly share with everyone else but we're still in discussion and work so there are a couple of more things that we need to kind of look at to make sure that we can get the information out to y'all but also you'll be able to you know award the students who can receive the funds in a good manner so i guess one other question i have what level of institutional financial aid administrators but i think you know again these funds are broader than just financial aid um are involved in kind of the development and in, in decision making and is that something um some of us here might be able to assist with um yes certainly i know we like to definitely reach out and get any feedback and so we have been uh, utilizing the data collection subcommittee that um, can represent and provide any additional feedback on um, administering some of the grants and the funding but yes if there is comments and feedback based upon what we have pulled together, uh, we'll definitely welcome those. And as soon as I can get some information out to get that feedback, then I'll share it with everyone to kind of say where we're at um, within the process. And if this is something that, you know, can be supported, you know, by the institutions, then we'll definitely take those things into consideration. Any other questions for John or myself? <laughs> all right um john thank you uh and it sounds like i mean not that your work ever ends but if there's going to be another round and session um you know uh we're, we're not done yet with a, a little break from uh you know the legislative uh work that's being done so it, it has been interesting times i'll i'll yeah. say that yes right all right, uh, let's plan uh, let here uh, to, to take a, a about 10 minute break. Uh, it's right at 11 o'clock, uh, according to my watch. So um, if we can be back about uh, 10 after 11, um, we will again take another roll call to um, uh, confirm that we have a quorum and then uh, we'll move on with our agenda item. So we'll see you back in about 10 minutes.
All right, it looks like a number of people are, are back. Um, and so let's uh, move on uh, with our meeting for this morning. Um, to begin, I uh, do uh, want to take uh, a, a, a roll again, uh, just to establish a quorum before we move on with the meeting. Um, so when I call your name, if you'll just uh, acknowledge your presence, um, and then we'll continue with the meeting. Uh, Denise Welch? Here. here. Robert Marino? Here. Uh, Deshay Reed? Here. Taryn Anderson? Here. Ben Bullen? Here. Victoria Chen? Here. Rochelle Garrett? Didia Gonzalez? Here. Heidi Granger? Here. Bridget Ingram? Here. Tan Gwynn? Here. Holly Nolan? Here. Shauna, Shauna Norton? Here. Uh, Steven Peterson? Here. Thomas Ratcliffe? Kelly Steelman? Here. Uh, Joy Thomas, Arnold Trejo, here. Uh, Foreman Thompson, I'm off mute. And then Jace Kugia. Great. It does look like we've got a quorum, so uh, let's continue. Uh, next agenda item is a joint update between. Um, uh, the uh, College Readiness and Success uh, Program uh, addressing House Bill 3 and our uh, task for subcommittee uh, with the addressing of House Bill 2140. So going to turn things over to uh, Claudette and Robert. Hey everybody, it's Leah Smalley here. Um, so we have a couple of slides and I've uh, volunteered to go first. Um, Robert is the chair of this particular committee, um, but because our meetings ended for the last update we gave you back in June, I believe, I decided to go ahead and provide the overall update for um, the 2022-23 TASPA. Um, I do have some slides, but the way that this virtual meeting works, I'm not sure if it will allow me to present those. Um, unfortunately, so we may have to just talk through it. I'm trying it on my screen right now. I'll see the screen or no. Can you see the presentation? Okay, good. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so again, my name is Leah Smalley. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid Services, and um, my team does oversee the creation of the paper TASFA form. Um, I'm going to move on. So today in this short presentation or update. We're going to be going over the 22-23 paper form and just give you some updates on what changed. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Claudette Jenks. She has joined us as well, and she's going to be going through House Bill 3 graduation requirements and also the House Bill 2140, which created the online task for application. And then we can move into any questions that y'all have. So I'm going to kick us off. So yeah. Actually, we sent out a memo to all directors only, and the reason we only sent it to directors is because we released the paper form yesterday for our kind of preliminary release. And we started doing that, I think, two or three years ago now, and that was actually a, a result of the feedback we got from FAAC. Um, FAAC has said, if we could only get it, you know, a month in advance, that would be really helpful, so that way we know what to expect. And also to be able to update our websites or if we have a vendor or anything like that, we have some time to prepare. So for the past few years, we've released this kind of preliminary copy. Um, so that was sent out again to directors yesterday. It's for institutional use only. So we do ask that um, you don't release that or publish it anywhere until October 1st. And at that point, the coordinating board will post it on College for All Texans. We'll post it to our student financial aid programs website. 
Um, but again, the, the idea is to align it with the FAFSA release so that students don't get confused or they start submitting them to you too soon. And then the other thing to consider is that while we don't anticipate any changes on the form, um, it's possible that you know we made a mistake somewhere. And so this four week period gives us an opportunity if we need to go back and make a revision of some sort, we have that time. Um, we'll also be releasing on October 1st, our Spanish edition. So we only release the English up front, but we are working on the Spanish copy now. So on October 1st, um, we will be posting those online for everyone. We'll send out a new notification just to let everyone know that that's available. Um, as far as changes on the form, we, we did talk about this in June. We decided not to make any substantial changes. And the reason behind that was one, because of the FAFSA simplification, it just seemed kind of like we would be doing a lot of work when we're not 100% sure on how the FAFSA is going to evolve yet. I mean, we know a lot of things that are going to change on it, but we didn't want to risk doing an overhaul on the form and then have to change it again. So um, the task uh, subcommittee, um, their feedback was, let's go ahead and wait. And then once we go into the next year's form, we'll have a better idea of how the FAFSA is going to look and all the different components of the new student aid index and whatnot. So that's why you're not going to see very many changes on this year's form. Um, the things that did change, the normal stuff like years, tax, um, tax references, things like that. So all the standard things should still remain the same. Uh, we didn't remove anything from the form this year. And then the one thing we got feedback on was selective service, our favorite topic. Um, there's been some confusion. This came from high school counselors that because of the fact that it's only for males, the actual selective service statement, that sometimes females get confused because at the beginning of the form and throughout the, uh, the task, but it says, don't leave anything blank. And then you get to the actual selective service section and they're like, well, what do we, what do we do? Because I don't have a spot to do and I'm not male. And I, you know, so there was that confusion. So this year we included a, I am female, I am exempt onto the selective service status statement. Um, we also changed the color of the banner and we got feedback that because it was bright red, even though that was supposed to draw attention to the section, it actually kind of deflected from the section because people just kind of skimmed right over it. They didn't really stop and look at it. We tried to draw attention to make sure that people stopped and read and understood that the um, Selective Service website resource was there and that you know it was in, it was required for males or it is required for males to register and whatnot. So again, very subtle changes made to the task for this year. Um, but if you have any feedback, you can email that through CRAFT, so our online form, the Contact Us form. That's kind of how we receive all feedback and inquiries at this point. If you can submit that and just put, you know, this is TASPA feedback, you know, we found this either mistake or feedback um, that we need to consider. Again, we're not making major changes, but if you find something that you feel is really important that we make before October 1st, if you can send that through Contact Us. I believe that's it. Again, we are going to circle back to questions at the end. So if you have any on what I just um, talked about, we'll stop at the end of the presentation to talk about those. But now I'm going to be turning it over to Claudette. She's going to walk us through the other two topics. Claudette? Thank you, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claudette Jenks. I'm the Director of College Access and the College Readiness Division. Um, I serve as a liaison and collaborator, collaborator with the Texas Education Agency on House Bill 3, FAFSA, and TASFA high school graduation requirement. And our division also leads the development of the online TASFA. Uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, I think you have, the, can you get to the next slide, Leah? Or no? Can you see it? It's on House Bill 3 on my screen. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Can you see it? Um, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, House Bill 3 was passed into law under the Texas Education Code 28.0256 during the 86 uh, Texas legislature. Uh, since then, the Texas Education Agency has established um, rules um, under 74.1023. Uh, this went into effect on uh, July 27th of 2021, and those rules reflect the requirements uh, of the House Bill 3 high school graduation requirements 
requirement where uh, a student will complete and submit a FAFSA or a TASFA before graduating from high school. Uh, this began with students who are enrolled in the 12th, in 12th grade this academic school year. Uh, each student must complete and submit a FAFSA, TASFA, or have a signed opt-out form in order to meet the requirement. As students are advised of this requirement, institutions uh, should anticipate receiving an increase in FAFSA TASFA submissions starting October 1. And you may also be receiving requests from high school students who submit a paper TASFA. Uh, students who submit a TASFA will, will need to require a method of proof of their submission. So from a K through 12 perspective, there have been many discussions about the disparity across institutions on how and when um, they notify students about their TASFA submissions. Uh, we're continuing to learn from institutions about these processes so we can better support counselors and others who work with students on their financial aid applications. And we also have a Texas on course, which moved into our agency. We work very uh, collaboratively with them as well in helping them craft and develop professional development training and recommendations for those advisors and counselors. Next slide. Uh, during the uh, 86th Texas legislat legislative session, House Bill 2140 was also passed into law under the Texas Education Code 61.07726. Uh, this established that the TASFA be electronic and linked through the Applied Texas system, which is also uh, something that is housed in our uh, college and career college readiness and success division. It is. Uh, it also created an advisory committee of stakeholders that were to make recommendations on how that electronic TASFA were to function, the cost, and some other considerations. Um, we want to also let you know that during the 87th Texas legislature um, this past session, legislation was passed that extended the implementation of the electronic TASFA from uh, the, it was supposed to go into effect with students enrolling this this fall but now it's been extended for the actual application of instead of the 22-23 TASFA application it'll be the 23-24 TASFA application for the academic year to align with the uh, recently adopted federal FAFSA simplification changes. Uh, we are aware that the, this timeline has also been changed. The FAFSA simplification changes timeline has also been extended. Or, and there's really um, some questions as to what you know whether we'll be able to align. But our development team that's working on uh, creating the online TASFA is preparing for these changes when they occur. Next slide. Overall, the intent of establishing the online TASFA is really to provide that necessary data so that schools can calculate an EFC, and currently that's the way the language is for now, um, or it's intended to provide information to provide an award for the uh, for the for students. Um, the TASFA will also have skip logic that will be built into the application to assist in reducing that application time and help improve that efficiency for the student. The student will have also have the ability to send the TASFA to multiple schools at once. And based on feedback from our TASFA advisory committee and other stakeholders, the application will align with the FAFSA questions and format uh, where applicable for ease of use. Uh, we also we want to remind you that the coordinating board will not serve as a central processing system, so no EFC or SAR or ICER uh, will be produced. This is just a transfer of information from the application to the institutions. Next slide. Uh, we want to share with you uh, some of the stakeholders that we've been engaging to inform the ongoing development. Uh, stakeholders included our institutions of higher education, uh, school districts and counselors that helped inform the TASFA data that would be put in the counselor suite eventually, and we can talk more about that here shortly. Uh, uh, we also have the Apply Texas team. Um, we have a contractor or a contract in place with the University of Texas at Austin. They have been um, also engaged in our, our development. The Texas Education Agency who leads the requirements of House Bill 3 has also been actively involved. Uh, they've also 
assisted our agency in funding um, some of this work. So we are we are very grateful for that. Uh, they have a vested obviously they have a vested interest in this development, considering the House Bill Three high school graduation requirement FAFSA. TASFA graduation requirement. Uh, we also have community-based organizations that have been in the mix, as well as our the vendors of financial aid management software systems. Next slide. Uh, much progress has been made to date. Uh, the TASFA is in development. Um, it's nearing completion, actually, and is entering to the next phase of work. When we say next phase, it's really kind of working and integrating it to the Apply Texas Counselor Suite and some other things. It's um, looking really good. We're hoping to have some demos uh, sometime soon. We've been having ongoing demos, but we're going into a user testing as well. Uh, the electronic TESFA will, like I mentioned earlier, will have skip logic and ability to save and sign this sign the application, and the students will be able to send their electronic TESFA to multiple schools. Um, the team is working on integration of this TESFA filing status into the counselor suite in the next phase. Our staff continue to discuss progress in determining how files will be sent to institutions. We've had some really great discussions with vendors and institutions about how file formats and what, what can be done in a reasonable amount of time to meet the requirements. We continue to have ongoing conversations with um, vendors and we also have, um, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, but just in case, uh, the TASFA advisory committee that was established under House Bill 2140 was um, convened and their task was to create that report for the legislature that talked about functional, uh, functional and technical aspects as well as cost. Well, that can, that task of that committee technically ended, and so, but we still saw a lot of value in, in those that gathered, and we sent out an email to ask them to continue providing feedback, uh, and we also took the time to merge with this existing committee, the Financial Aid Advisory Committee's TASFA subcommittee work group. So um, we've merged those two together to create more of a ad hoc work group that will continue guiding content, technical development, and testing. But um, we found that those were some volunteers that wanted to remain in the loop and uh, help with this development. So and we're still seeking additional feedback throughout this process. Um, the coordinating board staff are also uh, working on establishing rules to administer the online TASFA, and the TASFA is expected to open October 1, 2022. And that's the update I have. Uh, we can open up for questions. Claudette, sorry, can you confirm on the um, confirmation for financial aid offices that a student has submitted a TASFA, um, what y'all might be, what, what that might look like. Are you going to send guidance on that? Is it up to the individual institutions to um, to do that, to confirm that the task was submitted to meet the high school requirement? That's a great question. So right now we're learning what is currently in existence. Um, my division does not have the authority to provide that guidance, but we're working with our uh, student financial aid office. What we do have ex existing, and we've been working with our te Texas on course uh, in professional development for those counselors and advisors, is to let them know, um, you know, to provide to to work with those counselors and tell them, tell the students that they could ask for this information, or they could, um, you know reach out to the institution. Sometimes, depending on what the institution has, it could be that they've marked it in their, in their once they sign on on a profile, um, you know, when they get established with the institution, there's some kind of a notification that a task has been received. So we're advising them on what's currently available and mm -hmm. making sure, uh, one of the other suggestions that, that's been said, but it's a little bit, um, and this is at the K through 12 field, is that they keep, uh, Counselors keep a spreadsheet that's secured, a secured spreadsheet to document who submitted TASFAs. Um, there's, we're, since we're working on this online TASFA, eventually there's going to be this data or accessibility for the counselors to see who submitted a, an online TASFA, but currently we, there's no other 
way to notate that. So a method of proof really would be um, what's currently in existence. So we've asked the counselors to reach out to the schools. So that's something that we're trying to let everyone know that, that you might get an influx of, of this request um, if there's not a current process in place. But you know there are institutions that do have a current process in place. So um, consistency across the, the state is not there, but we're trying to learn and see what we could advise. I guess my concern would be, I, I agree with you, a lot of schools have a process in place for confirming that the test was received on some kind of, let's say, student portal. Um, but is that going to be accepted across the board on the high school side? So that's what you're saying. You all are trying to pass information on to them about what what kinds of ways schools might or students might prove this in order to have high schools be on the same page. I guess that would be my concern is that some schools would want something different. Some schools are going to want letterhead and some schools are going to want, I don't know, the, whatever it's going to um, to look like. So I appreciate knowing y'all are working on that piece, but um, I guess just that it, there's only a month to get all that information across is a little worrisome. Well, we have um, Texas Encourse has been working with Texas Education Agency to provide that guidance and the method of proof is outlined in the rules that I provided in the in this document. Um, but it is loose and there are, like I said, there are recommendations. That's why we are trying to figure out how to better support those counselors. But to your point, method of proof is, is really up to the institution and how they report that to the um, to TEA. So it's with the Texas on course has in collaboration with us and with TEA, we've just, we've kind of determined some parameters of what an acceptable method of proof would be specifically around TASFA in the meantime, before the online TASFA is available. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One thing just to chime in, um, the way that the rule is written as with everything very, like you said, loose is that it says the school district is the one that, kind of determines what is accepted. So you you may see a disparity between all the districts um, across the state. So that gets tricky too. So we have tried to kind of push that they provide guidance, but it's kind of in a strange spot because you've got um, TEA saying, oh, well, the coordinating board needs to kind of make that decision because the institutions need to tell us what they can provide. We're like, well, we need to know what you want. So it's kind of like always in limbo on who's going to make that decision. But ultimately, um, because this is TEA's um, requirement and their rules, um, we're working with them to try and hash out what that would look like. And then ultimately, they'll communicate that to the school districts. So as soon as we know more, yeah. I'll go ahead and Right, and it can be as simple as a letter or an email that's that they received the TASFA application. But we've learned in the process that it's different across the state. So it could be a letter, it could be a, a snapshot of their you said a profile, you know, their profile or their um, you know where they log in. It could be that. It it can be any of those things. So that's what that's the guidance that we're providing. I don't think they're being as stringent that it has to be one particular thing. So, um, and the rules are very, again, very loose until we are able to work and identify other methods or ways that the TASFA can be, um, that student knows or can provide proof that the TASFA submitted. We won't know those until we, we kind of work through that. I see a couple of hands um, raised. So I'm gonna go to Shauna first since I saw her name up. Um, yes, and I'm not sure if this is a better question for y'all as presenters or for maybe the committee, but um, in looking at that as a school district, we're going to be perfectly pleased if the students have a portal that they can print something off on that says your TASFA was submitted. Um, now, I can't say across the board, but uh, we will be. But for the schools that don't provide that or that it takes a significant period of time before that would show up on their portal? Um, is there a recommended time that we should tell students they need to wait from the time they mail their paper TASFA until they start requesting that information from financial aid offices? I'm going to chime in again. Um, a so it gets complicated because, again, uh, we've had so many conversations on did the student apply there? Did they Are they enrolling? And so you may have an influx of TASFAs that come through. Um, and so different schools process the TASFA in different ways with different timelines, depending on technology, staff, 
um, a variety of different things. So I think today what we were trying to communicate to institutions is um, to start having those conversations on what you can accommodate because you will, no matter what, you're going to get inquiries from high school students that need that confirmation that you got their TASFA. Um, so to be prepared with that. Again, we don't have the structure on exactly what that needs to be. It might be an email, like, you know, just shoot it out to them. If they have a portal, they can do a snapshot, that kind of thing. But it's really just, you know, be prepared because in the coming months, you're going to see an increase in both FAFSA and task fees potentially. Leah, and to follow up with that, a portal snapshot sounds great and is an easy way for the student to self-service that. But that is assuming, I, I would guess, that Shauna can confirm, that that portal snapshot shows the student's name and confirms that that checklist is theirs. And not all of our portals look have you know the student's name id school and like comp and base and confirmation that that it was a taspa that was submitted so um that i mean that would be great and some of them probably look that way but i would imagine a portal snapshot is actually not going to meet the standards for some high schools for what they're looking for to confirm that it's that student and a taspa um, or something that was submitted so that'll be interesting um. Um, before I call on Bridget, there have been discussions. I think there's just, um, they're looking, the school districts are looking for any way to document that this. So it, it it's no set term or no set anything. We've toyed around with saying uh, maybe having everyone send letters upon or emails might be the way to do this. But again, to Leah's point, our agency doesn't oversee this policy. So we are only at what we as an agency are authorized to provide. Um, not to say that we can't collaborate, but there, you know, it has to come to a mutual understanding. Um, and I'll go ahead and uh, have Bridget unmute herself. I think it's going to be somewhat troublesome for the schools to coordinate all the different things that they're getting, right? If it's an email or a printout or a form. So I kind of, I kind of feel for them on that aspect. We already have an electronic task. So our plan was to have once they submit like a submission page um, that they can print. I appreciate you bringing up, I think it was Taryn about like putting their name on there because that's something we need to make sure is on there. When I look at our financial aid portal and I go in and I say print this, you know, status, whatever, it doesn't, I don't think, have name on there. So we need to figure that out. And then for the committee, I guess, even beyond TASFA, what are y'all doing for FAFSA? Um, that's going to be, you know, another hurdle. Um, if there was some type of standard, that would really be helpful. And I know the court board's not over it, but I, so, I, the standard so would so to answer your question, Bridget, on the FAFSA, I think there's a lot of method, a lot of acceptable methods of proof that are outlined in those rules, in the rules that I shared with you. Um, a simple um, notification, an email that said it's been submitted from the FAFSA side will suffice. So it's, I don't think that's much of a lift for the institutions. The lift for the institution would be the notifications for the TASFAs. That's where there's just not a lot of guidance that we can provide because everyone does things differently. So I'm glad that this is creating such a great conversation. I'm going to see who, I, who next. I think Denise was the next one to have her hand raised. The concern that I have uh, of having to provide a, a letter um, would be for me. That's not a big deal because I probably get 25 to 30 TASFAs a year. But for a school that gets thousands of TASFAs a year, that's not that's not going to be practical. You know, um, so I think that that could be problematic, especially for our bigger schools and universities. Correct. And it, it's not that's not the only method. It's just any notification that a, that a task has been received. It can be an email. It could be, I mean, a letter It could as costly, obviously, but it's something uh, to represent that the student has received the task is what they're looking for. So if there are, if you all have suggestions on what that might look like as a cost efficient me measure, that would be great to send us some suggestions. Um, 
And we're open to those because we are, until we have the online TASFA built for the state, the online test was going to be hopefully great. Um, from our expectation, we, we see that it looks like great. There's also going to be a, um, a feature where a student can print out the actual application. So that might that will eventually serve possibly if it says somewhere that it's submitted. Um, that could actually be the notification. But that's until we don't have that now for this year when it went into place. So that's where we're having some challenges. But we just want to let you know and make you aware that there you're going to you might see this influx of, of met, a request for method of proof. Um, I'm going to there's one more hand up that I see. Let me see if I can get to it. Uh, Ed? Yeah, uh, just a, a couple thoughts about, uh, you know, this with the TASFA. Um, one would be, you know, like you say, even though there's there's not standard clarification of what constitutes, you know, the school satisfying the requirement, but, you know, I think some guidance to colleges and universities to say what, you know, what constitutes this, you know, a, a legitimate submission of a TASFA form. Um, and, you know, schools have varying requirements. I mean, we do a kind of standard verification process for all TASFAs, but just if the student submitted the TASFA form to us and it's materially complete, would that be sufficient, you know, versus have they completed everything we would normally require in order for us to calculate an EFC and determine eligibility? Does the student need to have applied and been admitted to university or just we received it? even though, you know, th those types of things, I think clarity on that. Um, second thought is, you know, if there could be possibly a standardized form that could be developed that would be given to counselors and or, you know, students to send to the school or a standard process that we respond to, that might assist us versus we get an email, you know, we get something in the mail, we get a fax, we get, you know, I mean, but if there's if there's at least a standard form that we would say, hey, this is a preferred method um, to provide schools with what they need. And then, you know, with the information so that we can efficiently process it. The last observation is I'm looking at the task for form and, you know, it does have the student list their high school information just like they do on um, the, the FAFSA form, um, might that be a trigger for schools to say, hey, when we get them and we see they've listed the high school that we have a practice to just notify the school, we received an application from a student who identified you coming from that high school and could that, you know, be an efficient way to do it as well um, in a more proactive way for schools to, to say, hey, once we get them, if we've got that, we can tell the school in whatever method they would say is acceptable. Is it a completed form or is it an email or whatever? Um, and get ahead of either the student or the school having to reach back out to us and say, did you actually get something? So those are just some thoughts, you know. Um, but, but I think consistency, you know, some even just best practice consistency um, on what, you know, what is expected that we as aid administrators provide to high schools and or students um, would be helpful, even though there may be alternate means and everything, so. Right, no, those are really great. Great suggestions and discussion. I um, I want to clarify something you mentioned just a while ago about what what does it mean as far as uh, the interpretation of a completion of a TESFA. Um, TEA sees that the they literally take the meaning of complete and submit, where the last step is submit. So just the TESFA form itself being submitted to the school is counted towards uh, their completion of the TASFA. Because if, if to your point, and discussion was early on that um, if you had to wait till it was processed where you had all the other supplemental documentation, that will definitely take go beyond the high school graduation time at, at some point. So um, that's what TEA's guidance is to schools, is that if it's submitted, just the, the application has been submitted, then it's complete and meets the high school graduation requirement. So I just wanted to clarify that right there. But a lot of the other 
uh, suggestions you have, we are more than happy to provide that. But uh, again, it's whether or not our agency is authorized to do so. And we're still kind of working on that. And I will continue working with the Student Financial Aid Office. Now knowing that there is a this uh, request, uh, as Leah said, it's, it's this weird situation where TEA is overseeing this, yet our eight, there's implications for our institutions, and where is our authority? Can we make institutions provide this information? Um, but yeah, that, these are all conversations we've had. So I'm, I'm glad that you've, you're at least providing some um, some recommendations on how we might be able to attack this. I say attack because it's going to be a huge deal here shortly. Um, but yeah, that's we're very open to any other suggestions that you might have. Um, so we'll look we'll look at I've jotted a lot of those recommendations that you said down and we see a lot of things. I see a lot of things in the chat. I'm going to go back to it. Uh, let's see. OK, so um, I don't know how much time I have. And how much time. OK. Yeah. Um, so one thing to consider, I really like the form idea, you know, I'm all about having kind of a resource for people so that people have something to do. I think my only thought on a form is that, you know, sometimes there's, it, it can sometimes cause more harm than good. It depends on what it is. And if the coordinating board doesn't have the authority or the, not even authority, but it's not written somewhere, then it can it kind of binds schools to a process that they may not want. So if you've got schools with um, they already have a TASPA, but now they're getting all these forms mailed in from students and they're like, no, no, we don't, we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it this other way. You kind of bind schools to doing it a certain way, or you get just an influx of forms that um, you don't have the staff to process. So again, um, I think it's a good idea. I think you use the word preferred. Um, so that's good. Kind of like, here's an option, but it's not required. So um, really good feedback. And I think we can start having those conversations with TEA and see what we can help them with. And just to add, Claudette, like you were about to mention earlier, um, there was some great feedback coming into the chat. You know, uh, Dee did mention, you know, most of their students have access to a portal when they've applied for admission. So things to consider when you're looking at certain items. And then also Bridget made the good point of, you know, you need to think about FERPA to and make sure that the student has consent to release to the school. So as you all are working together along with TEA to kind of figure out what to do to go forward in the guidance, you know, definitely taking some of these things into consideration um, that were brought up by the committee. Yes, thank you. One more you, thing I mean, oh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Ed. You, you just mentioned FERPA, which just threw up a whole nother, you know, uh, thought there. But I I guess a, a thought there is, is, I mean, there is guidance about what can and can't be released from a FAFSA from the Department of Education um, related to FERPA and what consent you need to get. Would that same requirement apply to a TASFA form or is TASFA not under FERPA and or other requirements to release information because it isn't a federal government form. Um, I, that, I just throw that out, you know, and do we have some leniency there or do we need to follow the same? We've got to get authorization to share any of this personal information with another agency or is the other agency because it's a high school considered to be a legitimate um, you know, uh, agency to provide that information, which again, I think the current guidance on FAFSA wouldn't probably be that broad. So those are all just random thoughts when somebody said FERPA. Uh, well, and and we we know from our sending and talking to our legal department, you know, obviously TASFA information is a subject to FERPA. Uh, the thing in this piece is whether or not the student has submitted an application. So that's literally the information you need to provide. It's the student's name and did they receive it did your institution receive an application. That is simply all the information that you need to include. A name and yes, we received your TASFA. Um, so but that, you know, if the, if it if there are other implications that you're thinking of, um, that would be helpful to know. But it's really 
only that they've received the the TASFA right. application. Right. And just can we share that without again getting into FERPA? You know, is that not a FERPA? A it's it really should be, and you're and you're making a really good point because I don't know how school counselors are going to do this, but it should be the student's responsibility to get that information to the counselor. Right, so right. I don't I don't see that the but you know there are some go getter counselors that are, talk on behalf of students. So I think you make a very valid point, um, but I, I'm not sure. We will only find out when we're implementing this. So we're essentially building the bridge now, um, but uh, it's something to look out for. I believe more likely that the student is responsible for getting that information and demonstrating the method of proof. So um, we'll, we'd love to hear from you if that's something that's happening otherwise. Uh, so we're looking forward to that additional feedback. <laughs> I, I have keep one more comment. Little, by I keep hiding. this little flowchart this flow chart and I, I don't think, I mean, this is the FAFSA flow chart, right? Like if you can disclose and I don't think we can disclose FAFSA to a high school. So I wouldn't think I would, we would probably follow this for TASFA and wouldn't, unless the student gave us permission to let the high school know we wouldn't do it. I just wanted to add one more thing because we are definitely being broadcasted here. So some of the comments are really great. So for the committee members who have, you know, additional feedback or comments, if you can, you know, speak to it that way, our listeners can also hear it. What they can't do is read the comments because um, they don't have access to it. But if we can um, definitely speak on whatever comments that you have, then it will be helpful for others to hear. So I know Heidi, you had brought something up into the <laughs> chat box and Shauna as well. So um, great to, you know, get your information. I'm guilty. I can address it if you'd like. <laughs> I was just, and Claudette, it's more to you, I think, than anything else. So, you know, we've been talking about it here for a, a couple months already, and we were planning on making it the student's responsibility and not put the schools in the middle. So if the request comes from the student, we'll be responding because the ISDs and the high schools are like, well, we'll reach out to you. And I'm like, no, I don't know if that's a good idea. So we're going to make it that so we're in compliance if we have the student request it, correct? And then what we were going to do is just follow up with either we haven't figured out if we're going to just do, you know, a quick form to the student because you're correct. All we have to do is say, yes, we have it. You've submitted it or just shoot back an email. And that's where, you know, to, because we don't want the student to have to come in either because they're still in high school. So is, is the email going to be OK back to the student from us so that it would come from the institution? Yes, that is an acceptable method of proof. So okay. as, as you're getting requests from counselors, that's important to note, you know, in your um, identifying FERPA and whether the student has given approval, I would always request that it was the student asking for it um, just because okay. that saves the FERPA requirement and, you know, gets complicated when others are asking on behalf of the student. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for that question. I see another comment, um, Shauna, did you want to? Yeah, I just was, in, in our district, we are trying to make it the student's responsibility to provide us the documentation for both FAFSA and TASFA. The question's just been giving them the guidance on how to best do that, you know, and like I said, if it's going to be in their student portals, if they have that, we can help them log on and get the information that we need. Um, if it's not, then just, you know, you, you need to wait and give them a month maybe after you've mailed your stuff in and then contact the college and see if they can give you a submission. But we at this point, we weren't sure what what to tell students. And so that's kind of what we're looking for. So I have one last thing because I think we need to move forward, but just wanted mm -hmm. to give a quick um uh, teaser that one we're going to do a demo at some point um, we have been doing demos with the vendors internally with TEA so we've been doing these demos to start um, showcasing what it looks like so I'm sure y'all are all probably like wow what does it look like if it's if it's almost built so I would think um, at the upcoming task for conference the plan is to do kind of a mini demo so that people can see that and then hopefully um, you know, potentially at a, another FAAC in the next couple uh, months or so, maybe the next one we can coordinate with Tashay to do a demo for y'all so you can see it. So that was it. 
All right. Well, um, I mean, some good discussion and, and I, I would say still some unresolved issues, but I think we've given good feedback for um, those folks involved and especially the subcommittee to, to possibly be working through and, um, you know, help with this. What I see as encouraging is once we have this electronic task available, a lot of these issues that we've discussed about how will high schools and students know they've submitted it, you know, will be resolved. But in the interim, you know, we want to know how we can best assist our students and, and schools, uh, our K through 12 schools um, in uh, fulfilling a requirement that that now is on them and to do it in an effective way. Um, let's move on to the next agenda item, which will be the data collection subcommittee with uh, D.D. Gonzalez. Hi, the data collection subcommittee met in July and the full notes that Deshay and her team are so gracious to provide us every time we're in the meeting handouts, but I'll hit a couple of the highlights for you. Um, they did update us on the new program participation agreements that were due, I believe, earlier this week. Uh, they did mention that the PPAs can be signed by any authorized person who can sign contracts or agreements for the institutions. And in their experience, that has typically been presidents, chancellors, vice presidents, et cetera. However, she did say that the um, they will definitely defer to the institution on who the best person is to sign those agreements. They also gave an update on the FAD modernization project. That project is in several phases. The first phase is to have the FAD's input files put into the cloud environment. It looks like the first major release for that is scheduled at the end of October. Um, there was also discussion on two statutes. One is the drug conviction for state aid. Um, it was brought up that that law is actually written to include any felony and not just controlled substances. So it brought to light that institutions will need to make that question more broad to cover any felony. Um, during the discussion, we did communicate that we should probably start that in 22-23 and not in the middle of an award year. So I believe more feedback would be coming on that soon. There was also discussion on a requirement in family law that any person that's behind on child support for 30 days or more cannot receive state uh, financial aid. Uh, the coordinating board's legal team has decided that that statute does pertain to state financial aid and that it will need to be complied with. There was a lot of discussion and questions on that particular subject, <laughs> a lot of back and forth on how, how would we do this, what would the requirements be. Um, I just I remember from that meeting more information will be coming, so I don't think anything was really kind of finalized or come to conclusion, but just to make us aware that that is a requirement and that more information will be coming on that. Um, they also updated us on depart the recent Department of Ed guidance. Of course, the Selective Service still working on uh, how they could adjust the rules and the guidelines to to uh, help with that. And that the verification, the new the verification um, relief that we got for 21-22, institutions can choose to apply that guidance to their state financial aid programs as well. So that was a welcome welcome news. Then we received several student financial aid program updates, such as the gear uh, information that was mentioned earlier, an update on their agency website redesign, some announcements and state resources published. Um, there was the same discussion we just had on the uh, TASFA requirement for high schools. We had that same uh, discussion during this meeting as well. And then just some upcoming memos, activities, and staffing changes that are also included in the notes. So in a nutshell, that was the highlights of the topics that we discussed. Any questions or does Shay or Leah, y'all want to make any other comments on any of that? No, I think you covered it pretty well. I know we have a, a similar discussion topic, um, which probably highlights the same information. So if there's additional questions that come up, we can definitely address them at that point. Okay, hey, thanks, Dee Dee. Um, let's move to uh, item I, uh, Legislative Subcommittee, Arnold Trejo. Yes, uh, Ed, um, I, I do not have any update for the Legislative Subcommittee 
Um, but I do want to mention that uh, you and I and, and Denise have had numerous discussions in the future direction of this subcommittee. So I'm going to yield the floor to, to you, Ed, um, to, to address what you and Denise envision for the future. Yeah, let me just give you a quick update uh, with uh, uh, a kind of, I think, what we have in the works and, and really then deferring to Denise as she um, uh, forms the committee uh, in the next year, but uh, did have opportunity to have discussion with the task of board uh, about the idea of uh, looking for ways to collaboratively um, work together on legislative issues. Uh, with the basic concept of having uh, possibly a representative of the um, uh, Financial Aid Advisory Committee um, be a member of the Legislative Committee for TASFA, um, and then that be kind of a, a, an avenue of some communication and bringing um, you know, issues together and having discussions. Um, and that seemed to be um, something that seemed reasonable and accepted by uh, by TASFA, um, you know, that if we were to recommend someone to be a part of the sub, their, their committee, um, you know, that, that, you know, that, that would be open to that. So really deferring the, the, all of this to Denise um, to, to make decisions about as, you know, really form things into the next year. Um, so unless there's any other comments, questions, uh, we'll move to the next agenda item. Okay, next agenda item is um, uh, the TASFA uh, recommendations and feedback from uh, Taryn Anderson, uh, current TASFA president. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have a couple updates on um, TASFA. At the last FAC, there was a request that TASFA um, consider some resources, some COVID resources um, and funding and HERF resources. We did, um, in an immediate effort to um, have something available and in light of the verification flexibility changes and lots of conversation going on between TASFA members, we did create a forum um, in, our in our website. So within member clicks, any member of TASFA can access the forum, can put a post out um, and can respond to it. And there was a little bit of um, chatter on there about some tools that different institutions were using for HERF and for verification, um, which was great. There was some initial chatter and then it kind of died off. Those forms still sit there and they can be utilized um, and they can be utilized for lots of different topics as they come about throughout the year. It's a resource that TASA has available that's at no cost to us or members um, that we just need to find a way to promote so that individuals can have a space to network about topics, including COVID. So that space does exist. If anyone is interested in utilizing it or bringing a topic forward, um, perhaps information or co further conversation about what schools are doing in light of this new uh, the oncoming TASFA FAFSA filing requirement for high school seniors, um, just let me know and I'm happy to help set those up. Um, we are also uh, looking forward to our conference coming up in October, and we do have some COVID-related, um, emergency aid-related sessions that will be presented um, at the conference. So hopefully that will be helpful as well. Many of you are planning to be there, planning to participate. Um, we are still planning on having an in-person conference at this point, but we're monitoring with the hotel um, on a weekly basis right now um, to make sure that we can do that in a, as safe a manner as possible. Luckily, it's a very large hotel with plenty of space, so social distancing would not um, be an issue. And that's one of the things that is leading us to continue down that path, um, as well as considering other um, COVID-related uh mechanisms for keeping people safe and what those will be and how we would roll those out to members. So we'll give updates on that for those of you who are planning to attend the conference. But the early bird registration date is September 9th, uh, which is coming up quickly if you're interested. And we did drop the price for anyone who wants to go to $225, which will 
be our least expensive conference in many, many years. Um, so we hope that that helps with uh, institutions to be able to send staffs in a year that we know that budgets are tight or perhaps send additional staff this year um, to Georgetown. The board is going to take some of our um, relief funds, our excess revenue funds in the last couple of years because we didn't have a conference and actually um, fill that gap, backfill that gap to allow us to offer it at a reduced rate. We do have over 150 members currently registered for the conference. Uh, we also have our new aid officers basics training that happens right before the conference. And we have about 30 members who are um, planning to attend that, which will also be hosted in person with social distancing available. And uh, that registration also is currently open on our website. And I had one. Oh, and then my year with the FAAC is closing. And um, we did have a change for our board this year. Cynthia was going to step in um, and was the president elect, but she moved out of her role into an associate member space. So she works for um, Inceptia now, which is great for her, but she's not able to serve as TASFA president as an associate member, no longer with an institution. Um, we were extremely fortunate that someone you all know is on the call, Robert, um, stepped into the role and is going to serve as task vice, currently TASFA president elect as of this summer um, and will be president effective November 1st. So thank you, Robert, for stepping in. And the good news is for FAAC, they don't lose Robert. We just get another year with him as part of FAAC, um, which is great. And so he'll serve the task role. And then um, Didi, who's also on the call, uh, was recently no uh, nominated and elected as the next president-elect. Um, so she's also been a member of FAAC and is a familiar face, and she will step into this role um, next year once Robert's year is completed. So luckily, there's a lot of familiar faces and a lot of engagement already for them on FAAC. So I think the relationship for TASFA and FAC is great. And I do, um, the board was very open, as Ed said, to the idea of the legislative issue committees working together and creating a bridge and putting all the powers, all the brain trusts in the same space. And so I'm excited to see how that looks going into this next year. Are there any questions or um, follow up for TASFA as we near the end of our year? We have about two months left for the current um, board and year. Great. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Karen. Uh, next item is uh, from our school district. Uh, any recommendations or feedback? Uh, ben Bolin and uh, Shauna Norton. Morning, I guess afternoon now. Hey, Shauna, do you want to start? Um, sure. I don't know that I had any recommendations or anything. I was, I had some questions that I kind of wanted to bring about, about TASFA, but I think that we covered those earlier. So I think I'm good from my perspective. Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I had similar things too, and I heard answers in the previous presentations. I just do, just curious uh, from the higher ed side that we're obviously having struggling issues with COVID and it's um, taking a big hit on staff as a whole. And it's not just teachers, it's bus drivers, custodians, cafeteria staff all over the place. Um, a lot of students out um, and decreased enrollment. Uh, district's trying to work real hard to get capturing students back. And um, many of those are at the senior level that would be completing that task and everything else. So just curious as far as I know with our higher ed partners too, uh, battling some de decreased enrollment is, is kind of common from what many of you might be seeing. I think we're all just COVID weary, um, <laughs> possibly. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think my take is there's just a lot of unknown, uh, but but really trying to move forward with uh, delivery of education in the most effective ways, um, you know, and uh, continue operations, you know, within our offices. Yes, and so you need to move back. 
the only, I mean, I mean, one question I have maybe, you know, for, for schools, you mentioned just this idea of, you know, enrollment and, and high school completion, um, you know, uh, not sure with, again, the graduating class uh, this, you know, this last year, um, were there students who just didn't meet graduation requirements and are now needing to meet those requirements to graduate? And then, you know, would there be a similar uh, possible, you know, situation, you know, uh, in the future? And just kind of what methods are there for students to complete graduation? So if they are desiring, you know, can continue their education um, at our institutions. Um, I don't know, Sean, do you want to say anything? Um, as far as get capturing students who didn't graduate last year, or I wasn't one hundred percent sure. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think I think just yeah. What you know, what what avenues are there for students who are not you know who are um, not haven't met the graduation requirements either for this year or anticipating not next year in order for them to you know. To, to get that credentialing necessary to, to, to move on with their education and, you know. I, th I think in general, we find that students who did not meet graduation requirements are also the students that we struggle to get to apply to colleges and make those post-secondary plans that we would like for them to make. Um, but I know that that that's always our number one focus every year is any students who didn't graduate to get them to come back, do whatever they need to do to finish. Um, and then we already have some that have been able to, you know, they were, they were lacking one credit. We've been able to kind of get them over that hurdle and they're about to graduate in the next couple of weeks because they finished that up. And, you know, and, and so part of that process is coaching them through the, the application process and trying to get them to, you know, look at options that are available to them through community colleges, even. Um, and then just depending on when they're, you know, if we can get them to apply what they're looking at, because I know one of the things we came across recently was a student who wanted to apply, but he doesn't want to start this year. He wants to wait and start next fall. So now we're looking at, we need to help him complete FAFSA, but we can't do that until October 1st and he's ready to finish up. So there's all sorts of um, things that, you know, kind of factor in there. But overall, most of our students that don't complete on time are students that we encourage, but don't take that post-secondary route. Yeah, we had a, um, we have a big credit recovery program that we had a lot of attendance in this summer, just having students come back, uh, complete a lot of credits online, um, you know, teacher supervised. We had a largest summer school we've ever had um, this past summer, uh, large summer graduations. And so uh, that, that, were, that was some of the different things. And we offered courses that we haven't ever offered before in the summer. Um, so those are some of the unique things we had, both in-person options and virtual options, just trying to capture as many kids as we can. Uh, but we do have uh, one of our alternative schools that uh, might be for students that are behind in credits. Um, and they had their largest graduation ever. And currently they have, um, I think, one of their highest enrollments. So those are students that we're trying to get through the, the pipeline uh, first just to get to that diploma. And like Shauna said, a lot of those may not fill out those, but uh, I know at those campuses, they were trying to, once they capture them back there, just kind of make that part of the process uh, before they finished up as much as they could, whether that's completing FAFSA or maybe, uh, you know, looking into applying to the community college that's here. Um, once they had them captured, taking advantage of those opportunities as much as they could. So, but uh yeah, it's a it's an ongoing process for sure. I know, like I've done a lot of just kind of going to homes and home visits and trying to capture students and bring them back, and and um, you know that's becoming pretty common. And we have one of those coming up here in September as a district. Okay, well, thank you uh, for uh, those insights and updates. Um, the next two agenda items uh, are uh, for Deshea, uh to talk a little bit about the program participation agreement, uh, as well as selective service verification, 
uh, controlled substance, other things uh, with changes with the FAFSA um, and FAFSA simplification. So just to give a, a really quick update going on with the program participation agreements, we did receive all of the PPAs from all the institutions. So we're happy to um, learn that everybody was able to complete that. Again, it was a change that we've done from the past from a 10 page, pretty much a 10 page memorandum of understanding down to a three page uh, program participation agreement. So I believe the uh, simplicity of it um, allowed for more schools to get it in a lot quicker, not having to make a lot of adjustments and changes to the language in the PPA. But what we did learn through that process is some of the fields on the form probably need further clarification, um, probably restrict um, better instructions in certain areas. We did have to do a lot of back and forth, especially with uh, the different check boxes in the areas. Um, so going into the next cycle, we'll make sure to address those changes that we um, identified. Um, the current PPA that everyone assigned is scheduled to expire August of 2023. So um, definitely want to get any feedback on your um, how it was to go through this PPA. Again, this is the first time we've done it for student financial aid programs and wanted to get any comments or feedback on the process. So that way, when we're looking at the next cycle, of PPAs will be able to address those. So if any of you on the committee have some feedback that you can offer, I'm definitely open to listen to it. So that means I don't get any emails next in the next cycle. <laughs> any questions? Didi, I think, uh, not Didi, excuse me, Denise, were you going to say something? Well, I was really afraid of this whole process. I, you know, it scared me because I thought, ah, something new. But really, it was very simple. And um, we appreciate the work that you guys did to make it as simple as possible. So thank you. I have to give a special thanks to my administrative assistant, Jody Lopez, which, you know, some of y'all um, received all of your PPAs through. So she worked on this as a major project um, coming aboard my team. So I think it went pretty successful and smoothly. So thank you to her and to all of you all to get it in as soon as possible. Well, if there are another questions and comments to that agenda item, then I'll go ahead and just kind of briefly move into the next one. Uh, Didi pretty much um, went through most of the information. We did release uh, an announcement back on August 5th talking about the impacts of the federal student aid changes that uh, impacted our state funding delayed requirements. Within that announcement, we did indicate that selective service and at the time controlled substance state requirements do remain the same. So you do have to collect those documentations. One of the things that was mentioned earlier was controlled substance going into felony. Um, and so we're going to definitely provide some additional information regarding that. The guidance will come out this month on how um, any changes to the selective service as we continue to review the Texas Administrative Code as well as the broaden um, from controlled substance to felony uh, on how that does impact or if there is an impact on financial aid, state financial aid. We also, of course, included the guidance about the verification, as Didi had mentioned, that institutions may choose to apply that federal guidance to the state financial programs. If there's a valid ESC, can be confirmed for you know calculating financial need for state awarding prop, uh, purposes. One of the things we did highlight in that announcement um, was dealing with tasks with students that Again, as institutions have discretion to select students for verification according to a consistently applied institutional policy. So uh, again, that came out on August 5th, but more information will be provided to all the institutions this month related specifically to selective service, as well as the felony conviction and changing of that language and what that means um, for changing any of the documentation that some of the institutions may use as they're collecting it from the students. So we'll get that out to everyone um, as soon as possible this month. All right, questions over those items. All right. 
I think we're on to the next agenda item. Yeah, so uh, I think we wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, just with other FAFSA simplification um, and, and some thoughts, uh, reflections on those, uh, and, and ask Denise to, to kind of lead us in that discussion a bit. Thank you, Ed. Um, on the student aid index, the, the thing that I was just kind of going through the NASFA, um, NASFA published a um, the changes to federal methodology and Pell Grant program uh, to 2021 plus, and it just kind of outlined some things that were going to change. And I, I didn't do an in-depth study in that because my mind is kind of a little blown a little bit, but there were some questions that came up as I was going through, and I would like some feedback, and I would like to um, take this discussion further as we go get closer to that implement, implement yeah, that word. Um, <laughs> that we uh, kind of look at some some questions that I had as I was going through this. Um, have any of you uh, studied this enough to see if it's going to make a drastic difference to your current Pell eligible students versus who could be Pell eligible in the future? Um, if you have, uh, let's just uh, do a thumbs up. All right, then. How about that? We're all ignoring this. It's like, OK, if we don't think about it, it's going to go away. <laughs> no, it's not, unfortunately. But there are some things that I, that I saw that were are going to be some big changes, in my opinion. Um, the, the fact that the business value your business and the farm is going to become more of a prominent, I guess, in the in the calculation. Um, I think what it says is, um, let me find it in my little notes. Hold on, sorry. Families will have to report the net value of any business or farm they own if they didn't qualify for the simplified formula that excludes the assets. Um, do you feel like this is going to be a, a, a burden for your students to be able to figure this out? Um, just like a little feedback on that and, and what your thoughts are. Denise, it's Kelly. Yes, yes. ma'am. I think it's going to be a huge burden for students because they already have a hard enough time answering those asset questions. So I think it's just going to create additional work for us trying to explain that information to them. That was my reaction as well, Kelly. I thought, wow, we have a hard enough time trying to help students work through that part of the FAFSA anyway. And it's just going to add a little extra complication to that. Um, especially when they have to figure out the net value. And so you have to, you know, what is my farm worth? What is my business worth? You know, what what do I owe? If it's tangible, you know, to maybe it's just an estimate. I just think that's going to be something that's going to be a little problematic for us as we go into the new calculation. Um, also, uh, the... Um, Child support received is coming back into play for those who don't qualify for the simplified needs. So I think there's going to be a lot of questions. And um, with the, the divorce and separated parents, um, I think that, you know, the parent that provides the most financial support, well, what does that mean? You know, you could be living with a single mom that gets, you know, thousand dollars a month and she's only making minimum wage so who's providing that that the most support there so i think it's going to be um hard to explain to students and i'd just like to get some feedback on what your thoughts are on working with students with divorced parents as well
it's me again. I think it's going to just, again, create additional work for us because we're going to have to sit down and try to help the student calculate in those situations or even where parents may have had 50-50 custody, which parent do they provide their information? And so, um, and I think it's going to create a lot more questions coming in from the high schools also as far as um, trying to help them and help them understand that things are changing and it's going to look a little bit different going forward. So, more work. Yay, yay. Well, that's a, that's a couple of the things that have kind of just jumped out at me as I'm going through uh, trying to understand what this means. And and I would like to, um, within the, you know, the next year, bring out some different um, parts of this SAI that we can discuss and kind of hash out uh, over the next coming months and, and even, even the next couple of years as we go through this this process in the new federal methodology. But I just wanted to kind of give you some thoughts and um, like we don't have anything else to think about, but that's just one more thing. And uh, just to kind of bring to your attention that some changes that are going to be on the uh, SAI. Any comments, questions? Denise, the other one that had jumped out to me, I hadn't done significant research on it, but the other one that jumped out to me initially was the change in um, number in college and how that impacted the EFC or SAI. Coming from, you know, especially at being at two Christian schools that tend to have big families with multiple kids in college, we've seen that impact on Pell Grants. And I know that that exists within several populations um, and just that that could change. I don't because of all the other changes, it's hard to identify how that will um, on the back end impact because it's easy to see in the current EFC calculation. You have two kids. It splits into two like that's very a, a very obvious um, change. And we can even advise families accordingly. And so then not being able to do that um it, or not being able to understand what that looks like is hard, but that's another piece that jumped out to me as a significant change for those families. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, and I understand according, you know, kind of just reading the NASFA publication that the, um, the number in the household will be taken into account with the poverty level. So that's still going to happen, but that number in college, I think, is significant for a lot of our families. There are no other comments. I'll turn it back to you, Ed. Thanks. Um, let's move to the next agenda item, agenda item O. Um, this is uh, basically uh, an opportunity for us to uh, affirm that this financial aid advisory committee uh, has value and should continue um, as uh, a, a, a way that we're contributing uh, to uh, the coordinating board. And so uh, I think really just wanted to open up conversation. Any thoughts affirming either this committee does have value and should continue, or I guess the opposite, anyone um, proposing that, uh, that, that this is not something, you know, really of value to the aid community and, and maybe question uh, a continuation of, of, of this format of providing input to the coordinating board. I think the only question I have with that is, I mean, is there need for some um, actual um, motion or anything or or just uh, just to say that we've had some conversation and without hearing any dissent you know that this does appear to be something that uh, that we would want to continue as a committee yeah i think just the discussion alone so we will you know continue to move forward um with the committee and do what we need to do to make sure it stays established mm -hmm. yeah so let's move on. We're we're close to the end here, folks. I know I'm looking at time, and and um, depending on you know how you are with when you need to eat lunch and things. I think uh, I've worked in the aid community enough that you know sometimes lunches never happen, but they're really nice when they do. So we will be wrapping up very soon. Um, 
uh, I think with what we have left, but uh, uh, that really, I think, all goes on the shoulders of Deshay because uh, next <laughs> item for you uh, is uh, providing uh, any uh, uh, information about uh, uh, what's going on with the coordinating board. Well, I'm definitely not going to be the one to stand anyone in the way from lunch, so I'll make sure that this is brief um, in a sense of any updates coming from the student financial aid program. So I'll go through just a couple of highlighted items uh, from the last time that we met on some accomplishments that happened within SFAP. We did send out a notice um, regarding the interest rate changes for the Cal and had changed effective February, excuse me, July 1st. Um, in addition to that interest rate, any of the new college access loans certified by the institution um, on or after July 1st would have that interest rate of 3.75%. So we sent that out some time ago. Also, our loan management system request for offer was released to the public on July 1st with a solicitation close date of August 26th. So submitted bids will be evaluated during this month of September. Along with, we did release all the 22 uh, program allocations. We also released educational aid um, application FAQs along with the funds request form, in addition to the bilingual education program guidelines, as well as that request form. We also just recently sent out some information regarding any reminders and resource updates that was announced on August 31st. And within that has a number of great items to consider. We are accepting funds requests for all of our programs. So if you haven't submitted any funds requests, please make sure to go and submit your first uh, request for those funds. Um, funds. We also provided some information for the TASP program that it has been extended for those schools who have TASP applications or certifications that they need to do. It has been extended to November 5th because we have extended the legislators to submit nominations to the end of this month, which is September 30th. And again, as a reminder, the scholarship amount is a maximum of $10,000 um, for 2022. Um, going back to that announcement we sent out on August 31st about reminders and updates, included in there was the fall 2021 calendar. So if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that announcement, it is also posted on the State Connected webpage for SFAP. So I would go out and make sure that you take a look at any upcoming deadlines as reminders. And again, probably circle back through to that particular announcement because we did provide a lot more information in there. Um, upcoming deadlines. And so we are past the deadline for the FADs for cycle two, but it is going to be upcoming for cycle three in October. So for those schools who have yet to finish their cycle two, you won't be able to advance forward to cycle three until you validate it. Cycle three, again, will open on October 6th. So we'll be telling institutions at that point that they can go ahead and submit files for FADs. Um, and I think that is it. Oh, we will have an updated webcast. So the last thing is, and I believe Leah had mentioned that, so that updated webcast will be on September 14th. So you'll get some information as to when you can log on for that. And I think I did that in a minute or two. So can't blame me if we don't make it to lunch now. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks, Deshae, for that update. Um, any questions for Deshae? All right, then um, uh, next thing we want to do just as, as we uh, kind of wrap up our, our time today um, is acknowledge members uh, who this will be their last uh, financial aid advisory committee meeting. Um, as their term ends uh, in, in this meeting. Um, and so I want to say thank you to Kelly Steelman, uh, Tam Gwynn, uh, Heidi Granger, and Taryn Anderson for your uh, involvement, participation in this committee. Um, uh, much appreciated. And um, uh, just want to say thank you uh, uh, for that time that you've given to, to this committee. The next item, uh, it's it's uh, it's noted to me that I need to pass the torch. 
um, as this will be the last meeting that I will chair and, and we're transferring uh, chair to uh, uh, Denise Welch. Um, and so my way of passing the torch, I was thinking, what can I do? Um, you always see people at concerts where they show their phone and they use it as a lighter or something. So I'm passing the torch. Denise, you need to show that you've accepted uh, the torch uh, by uh, light on your phone. OK, so the torch has been passed. Uh, so, Denise, uh, I turn the rest of the meeting over to you. Thank you, Ed. And um, just a, a, a few statements about Ed. Thank you so much for this year, and we appreciate your leadership as we've gone through a um, year that was quite interesting, to say the least. And we do appreciate your leadership and your guidance as we work through our um, COVID and we work through Zoom meetings, and we appreciate uh, Deshay and her team for um, helping us work through all of this as well. And um, so to a year that was unprecedented and uh, unusual and all those unwords, uh, we thank you and we appreciate your service to our committee and uh, especially Deshay and your team as well. So thank you both. Yes, yes, applause, applause all around. So, um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is do we have anything that you are just dying to talk about for our next meetings that we can have presentations on, subjects that you want to uh, bring to this committee so that we can talk about some issues? Uh, anything that you have that uh, you want to talk about in the future? You guys are kind of quiet today. Everybody's on mute. Okay. Well, if you think about a topic that you would like for us to uh, talk about in the future, please uh, shoot me an email and we'll get that or shoot Deshay an email. We'll get that on the agenda and um, and see what we can work out to bring those topics to, to this committee. So the last thing standing between you and lunch is adjournment. So as my first act, um, as chair, I will say uh, we're adjourned. Do I have to have a vote, just Shay? I believe so. Okay. So do I have an emotion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. And do I have a second? I'll second. Who's that? Dee Dee? Kelly. Kelly, sorry, I didn't see you. Kelly, a second. And um, all in favor, raise your hands. Awesome, awesome. Well, we are hereby adjourned. And thank you guys for your time. And we look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, Deshay. Bye, thank everybody. you. Bye-bye. Have a safe weekend. Y'all too.